Good morning. I am Lynn Goldman. I'm Dean of the Milken Institute School of Public Health, and I'm delighted that you are joining us here today. We have a wonderful three hours of expert insight and discussion on the state of play with regard to health reform. That is to say, if anybody can be certain of exactly what the state of play is at any given moment. We'll be taking a look at the impact of health reform efforts on key sectors like consumers, hospitals, and insurers. As you know, so much has transpired over the last several months. The effort to move legislation aimed at repealing the Affordable Care Act recently failed, but now there are further talks about reviving the push to repeal and or replace this law. And in the months ahead, we may also see administrative actions designed to reduce federal substance subsidies to change uh, the health insurance exchanges, perhaps shift the funding for coverage perhaps even change the kinds of services that are deemed essential under um, insurance policies. Despite the instability and concern that this current state of affairs brings, and perhaps because of it, I believe there's never been a more interesting time to be in public health. Our faculty and students have had a chance to influence one of the greatest debates in our country's history, the right to affordable health care. We have dozens of former students who are working on Capitol Hill today, and they are helping the public health message come through loud and clear. And we need to make sure that these public health efforts are vigorously defended. I would like to acknowledge our Chair of Health Policy and Management, Tom Levice, who actually uh, could not be with us today. He's en route to another public health week function in another city. And our faculty members who have been responsible for the conception of today's event and for helping to do all the work that needs to be done to pull it off. To recognize a few of them, Sarah Rosenbaum, um, Leighton Koo, and Jeff Levy. Thanks, um, thanks to you. Um, I'd also like to thank our panelists who are joining us here today. Thank you in advance for your time and your efforts. We are eager to hear whatever wisdom you have to impart to us today. Uh, with that, welcome. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so it's really my pleasure to kick off the first panel of the morning. Uh, we could not ask for a better panel. Uh, this is the panel to have when things are so exciting that um, the dean is is texting you about the article she read at 7 a.m. wanting to be sure that you know we work it into the panel. Uh, uh, we were all reading the same article at the same moment um, uh, and I'm sure this was a Times article about the latest negotiation uh, uh, over the future of the Affordable Care Act so I'm sure we will uh, get to that. Uh, let me begin by introducing the panel and really this is a panel that needs no introduction. We are extremely fortunate to have them here today. Uh, to my immediate left uh, is Gail Walensky, who's an economist, senior fellow at Project Hope, with, uh, as is true with all the other panelists, an extraordinary uh, career in public policy. Uh, I first uh, came to know Gail uh, when she was head of what we now know as the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, she served as head of then the Healthcare Financing Administration, uh, went on to serve uh, under the first President Bush in the White House as, as head of health policy on the Domestic Policy Council, uh, has a prolific author uh, and thinker about um, a, a huge range of issues in health and health care, uh, and particularly system and delivery reform. 
Uh, to Gail's left is Diane Rowland, again, a name that I'm sure needs no introduction. Um, I don't know what we would do without the Kaiser Family Foundation website. Uh, uh, most of our <laughs> many, many, many assignments uh, uh, from the school um, have their origins in materials at the Kaiser Family Foundation website. Uh, Diane is, uh, uh, like Gail, someone with an enormous background in public policy, served in the Carter administration, um, uh, uh, has gone on to a career in public policy and research, uh, like Gail, a researcher by training, uh, and uh, ha as we know her today, is the executive vice president of the Kaiser Family Foundation, uh, and um, for many, many years wore the hat of the executive director of the Kaiser Commission on Medicaid and the Uninsured, which of course is part of uh, Kaiser Family Foundation, uh, and uh, was the founding chair of the Medicaid and Ship Payment and Access Commission. So tremendous expert on uh, uh, public financing and health care for the uninsured. Uh, to uh, Diane's left is Dean Rosen. Uh, Dean, again, like Gail and Diane, huge background in public policy, uh, served as staff director and counsel to two uh, congressional health committees, both Ways and Means and Finance. I don't know anybody else who's done both committees, actually. Uh, I don't know if you're, if you're as unique as I think you are. Oh, yeah, that, totally. You're totally <laughs> unique. <laughs> yeah, uh, and you know. more than I know, <laughs> probably not, it, uh, is uh, currently a partner at uh, Melman, Castagnetti, Rosen, and Thomas, uh, somebody who... Uh, so many people look to for advice and, and insights onto, into healthcare politics and policy. And finally, um, to Dean's left is Sabrina Corlett. Again, her name um, uh, and, and the uh, uh, work she does at Georgetown should be second nature to a lot of students in the room. Uh, the uh, Center on Health Insurance Reform uh, is probably the leading source of information on sort of the law and policy of uh, the kinds of market reforms and insurance reforms that we saw uh, in the Affordable Care Act. She's a prolific writer on the subjects. Um, and the first, um, the first place I go to when I'm looking to sort of gain some insight into uh, how changes in, in, in health policy would affect the insurance market. So, uh, and like her, her colleagues, a long background in uh, uh, work on the Hill uh, and uh, a prolific scholar in her area. So with that, um, what we're going to do this morning uh, is some fast round robins with an eye toward um, uh, bringing our structured discussion to a close early enough so that there's time for uh, questions and interaction from the audience. Uh, and I'm going to start uh, just quickly. I'm sure with this audience I don't have to spend more than one minute on it. Um, just reminding everybody um, sort of where this story begins. The story, this morning story, all stories have a beginning. Uh, this morning story's beginning is the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the Affordable Care Act um, uh, is going to figure throughout the morning uh, for purposes of this panel. We're really focusing on the insurance provisions of the Act. Obviously, there are other major portions of the Act that will come up at various points. Uh, but where insurance is concerned, um, uh, it, it always depends on who you ask. Sometimes it has three pillars. Sometimes it has four pillars. Sometimes it has two pillars. I like the four-pillar model. Uh, so the, the Affordable Care Act, for our purposes, really had four pillars or has four pillars. Um, the first is, of course, a restructuring of the rules that govern insurance markets, um, and particularly, and they the rules take many forms, but the fundamental issue being that the market remains open to people regardless of their health condition, uh, both in terms of who can gain access to the market uh, and um, how, how insurance products are priced. Um, uh, and these reform, the, these market reforms are, of course, nationwide, uh, and they were created as nationwide reforms for reasons that we'll probably get into because it becomes very germane to where we may be going. Uh, the second pillar is the affordability pillar uh, uh, when it comes to the insurance market, the creation of both premium subsidies or premium tax credits uh, that are gauged to family income 
uh, and cost sharing assistance, so funds to help people once they enroll uh, for the cost of their care for, for lower income families. Um, the third pillar is the system of health insurance exchanges, now the marketplaces where people can go online and shop for a policy and get the financial assistance. Um, and of course the exchanges are heavily populated by people who need financial assistance for their coverage. And finally, um, uh, the, um, uh, is, is the Medicaid reform. Um, and uh, for a number of reasons that I'm sure will come out as we proceed, uh, Medicaid was the mechanism of choice uh, for covering the very poorest populations. So those are sort of the four major pillars that this panel is concerned with. And I'm going to actually ask um, Sabrina to kick us off. Um, and, and my question to you, Sabrina, is going into the current uh, uh, world in which we find ourselves. Um, can you sort of give us a little bit of insight into both what you see as the principal achievements of the Affordable Care Act and where in terms of the insurance markets um, there was work to be done? Sure, absolutely. Um, well, the, the first thing I would say is uh, in spite of some of the rhetoric that you see from congressional leaders and this administration, the Affordable Care Act insurance marketplaces are not imploding. Um, they, are, they are not collapsing. Um, in fact, um, what we have seen is while certainly insurance companies struggled financially and, and had a pretty rough time, many of them, not all of them, um, in 2014 and 2015, um, financial analysts, uh, as well as, frankly, the Congressional Budget Office, have said that really it's it's a pretty stable market going into 2017. Um, you see, you know, there are some companies still struggling, some companies doing well, but on the whole, a stable market. Um, that said, uh, um, you know, regardless of who won the election in, in November, I think. Um, Folks, even the, the strongest proponents of the ACA would have said that uh, it, it needed some improvements and um, some effort, uh, efforts to stabilize the markets even further and make them um, a, a, a more um, appetizing or attractive place for insurance companies to participate. And I think it's important for folks to understand there is absolutely nothing requiring an insurance company to participate in these marketplaces. So essentially it has to be a profitable line of business for them, for them to want to stay. Um, so there are a few things that I think had Clinton uh, been in office, there would have been a lot of pressure on Democrats to work on, and they remain um, issues and challenges uh, if, even if nothing is done um, legislatively or otherwise. Um, so first of all, insurers were facing lower than expected enrollment in the individual market as well as a sicker than expected risk pool. Um, why is that? Um, in some cases, it's for a good reason. Um, fewer employers dropped insurance plans than the Congressional Budget Office had projected would drop. So that's good because people were able to stay on their employer-based plan. On the other hand, um, lack of affordability um, was a reason why many, many people, particularly healthy people, chose not to enroll in coverage. Um, many people just still found those premiums to be too expensive. Um, I think we also saw insufficient investment in many areas in outreach, education. Um, this, the, the eligibility and enrollment process was very burdensome for people. So it, for many people, and, and particularly Diane and Sarah, you've worked a lot in the Medicaid space, you know that when eligibility and enrollment is really challenging for people to get through, it deters a lot of folks from signing up. Um, so affordability, um, uh, addressing the, the likelihood that um, even if you improved affordability, the individual market is probably going to be somewhat sicker pool than the group market, um, simply because there are a lot of people who don't work because of health issues. Um, you know, these are issues that Congress uh, and the administration, uh, regardless of their, their politics, um, are, are going to have to work on in order to sustain these markets. Great. So, Diane, if you had to identify um, the things that, as the Affordable Care Act uh, 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 moved to implementation, um, emerged as challenges in, 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 in Medicaid uh, and, and coverage of the poorest uninsured, what would they be? 
Well, I, I think that the most important thing the Affordable Care Act did was it tried to separate once and for all Medicaid eligibility from the welfare system and for the first time allowed for the coverage of adults without dependent children who were poor to be covered rather than having to meet a category. Um, obviously, they tried to do that with a very big incentive, 100% federal financing for three years going down to 90% thereafter. Um, and two issues came up from that. Of course, the Supreme Court decided that that was coercive on the states and that that expansion should be an option. And I think the other thing that came up from that was there became a large resistance in many of the states, um, some that expanded and many that did not, to the fact that that was going to cover able-bodied adults. And somehow we got low-income, poor adults defined as able-bodied who should be working, and if they aren't working, they shouldn't be eligible for coverage. And that continues to permeate the discussion. And I think uh, one of the challenges there is to decide whether as a nation we are providing health care services to poor people because they are poor and they are often sick, or whether we're providing it as part of a cash assistance welfare mentality. So I think that was one challenge. The second challenge I thought with the program was that we never resolved what to do about the Children's Health Insurance Program, CHIP, um, which is extended until September but has not really been fit into the framework of the Affordable Care Act without um, any continuation in sight right now. And so I think really dealing with how the pieces of Medicaid fit with the marketplace, with employer-based coverage, and especially where CHIP fit in um, are unresolved issues that need to be addressed. Um, also, I think that one of the things that the Affordable Care Act did well for Medicaid was it opened some new opportunities for delivery system reform and especially for advancing some more home and community-based services around long-term care. And I think that's an area that uh, Medicaid needs to expand in and needs to do more. But obviously the critical thing now is that 32 states, including D.C., which I like to think of as a state, um, expanded the Medicaid program and 19 did not. But the mix of the expansion has both Republican governors and uh, Democratic governors. So we have, you know, what will happen to the expansion states going forward. Over 11 million people were newly insured by the Affordable Care Act. So the challenge now is, will we see more of that group insured or will we see less? Will some of the expansion states continue if there's changes in the financing? Um, one of the issues that states raised was they weren't sure the 90% would continue forever. And I think they see now that that may be very threatened. Um, and will some of the non-expansion states decide that they really want to move into this area. We saw Kansas try to put through an expansion that uh, failed with to override the governor's veto yesterday. So I think the challenge for Medicaid is how will it continue to provide services to the lowest income population? How will the delivery system evolve and change so that it can be more coordinated care? And how will we really um, continue to finance this program? And obviously, there are lots of other changes being proposed for Medicaid that weren't part of the Affordable Care Act. Great. Thank you. So, so we're hearing from Sabrina and Diane major advances with some structural um, issues and some underlying political issues, particularly in the characterization of people, um, uh, uh, of Medicaid and Medicaid expansion and, and uh, 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 the, the people who would benefit from the expansion. So I've asked Gail to talk about a, a little bit, an issue that Diane actually just touched on in the end, um, but that deserves, of course, a huge amount of attention. And it is an issue that was sort of, the surface got scratched in the Affordable Care Act, but not big. Uh, and so this was the work we thought we were going to be doing. I think the uh, characteristics of the ACA that uh, you laid out in terms of insurance market reform, affordability, exchanges, and Medicaid really characterize well what the uh, Affordable Care Act focused on. Um, sometimes people had said about the Affordable Care Act, this is comprehensive 
health care reform. But it wasn't. It was primarily about coverage expansion. Uh, no small deal in this country. Uh, but coverage expansion, doing things to make the insurance market fairer, uh, more accessible, helping to subsidize people uh, when they try to buy insurance or making uh, Medicaid a low-income program rather than a targeted uh, low-income program are important uh, because having coverage uh, is important both for the people affected and the communities where they live. Um, in some ways, given our struggles, uh, it's unfortunately the easy part uh, of comprehensive health care reform uh, or should be the easier part uh, of comprehensive health care reform. It's not been so easy in the United States. But that really doesn't get you per se very far in what uh, we have articulated uh, in academia, uh, in the uh, discussions about uh, health policy, uh, the desire to have a high-quality, patient-centered, sustainable delivery system. That's really what we have wanted to focus on. Uh, that, of course, those words strung together should sound very familiar uh, because we use them all the time. We just haven't done a very good job of trying to get there. Uh, and it's because so many pieces uh, have to change uh, in order to have that happen. Um, we talk about the move to evidence-based medicine, uh, and we have made some steps uh, on moving to evidence-based medicine. Uh, but the variation in care that exists across the United States uh, is truly astounding and not in a good way. Uh, we have some really good care, excellent care provided in some places in, in the country. Uh, we have a lot of places where that is not the case, uh, although not such a good reasons why it couldn't be more the, the case. Um, we, are, we have seen in the last decade a real movement uh, toward having uh, larger uh, groups of physicians practicing together, uh, going away from the uh, very small uh, practices. Uh, that can be helpful, and there have been uh, attempts to try to encourage that uh, in various ways. When you actually look at the Affordable Care Act, what you see is what is in statute for the most part relates to expanding insurance coverage uh, and trying to fix the insurance market, particularly the insurance market uh, for individuals, for those who are not uh, in group coverage. And most of the rest of the act uh, was trying to encourage innovations uh, in changes, trying out things, and that included both the payment part uh, and the actual delivery system. One of the few uh, areas that was in the legislation per se um, involved uh, the accountable care organizations, uh, although uh, that has turned out to be, as, as many of the delivery uh, changes that have been tried, uh, a rather mixed bag. Uh, most of what we have seen in terms of uh, action uh, has to do with the pilot activities that were encouraged, largely uh, as a result of CMMI. Uh, and most of the findings there uh, have been a little disappointing. Um, that happens. That's, that's really not meant uh, as a criticism of what is done. Uh, if you're trying something new, uh, you only know how it'll work uh, after you try it. Uh, it has been disappointing, I've, I've at least been uh, quite disappointing, uh, that a lot of the pilot projects that have been tried uh, has indicated what doesn't seem to have a big change. Um, and so we're getting quite good at being able to enumerate those things. Although um, I am a little worried that so many of the pilot projects are going on at the same time that it may be nullifying results that would occur uh, if it was more focused uh, and limited uh, in change. Um, we are hearing a lot of talk about movement away from fee-for-service. <coughs> Actually, if you look at how most physicians are paid, uh, even when they're part of larger groups, uh, it still is fee-for-service. Uh, and while moving to a different system doesn't um, guarantee that you will have a different outcome, 
uh, the nature of a micro-level fee-for-service system where you are paid for various delivering small pieces of care is just not conducive toward moving to an integrated delivery system that focuses on uh, coordinating care across the various uh, physicians, uh, clini other clinicians, uh, and what goes on uh, in the hospital. Um, we are seeing some payment reforms being tried that are le least consistent uh, with this movement, and I would say the ACO has been an attempt to try to get physicians uh, and hospitals who have not formally worked together uh, to do so. Um, also, uh, some of the bundled payments and the episode uh, payment uh, activities uh, the same way. Um, it won't be enough to just do payment reform, but it is hard to imagine the kind of move to an integrated uh, delivery system providing coordinated care using evidence-based medicine uh, without having uh, the payment uh, for reform. So uh, necessary, but not in itself um, sufficient. Uh, there does seem to be more interest uh, in trying to encourage and promote uh, the integrated delivery systems. Uh, we don't happen to live in a part of, a of the country where that is very uh, prevalent. Uh, I'm on the board of uh, directors for Geisinger and seeing the kind of activities uh, that they attempt to do with uh, their uh, groups of uh, employed physicians in the hospitals that are part of Geisinger uh, is uh, an interesting example of what uh, you can do, uh, but it's not so easy for them either. Uh, they, there are areas that they do really well in, and there are other areas, uh, including consistency, uh, where um, they uh, struggle with some of the uh, same problems. Uh, one final point is that uh, when you look at the attempt to get larger groups of clinicians and clinicians in hospitals, uh, uh, practicing together, which is the bottom line of a lot of the activities that have been going on, um, you are at least setting up a structure that's more conducive to including some of the social determinants of health. Uh, as I, I don't need to spend a lot of time talking to a, a school of public health, uh, we know when you look at the array of potential ways to intervene, uh, medical care uh, is important and at certain moments in time in somebody's life, extremely important. Uh, but basically, if you want to improve their health, uh, it has to do with all that other stuff. Uh, and that is also one of the real problems uh, that we have had uh, as we have tended historically to have relatively small groups of physicians uh, being reimbursed on a fee-for-service system. Um, it's really hard uh, to be uh, organized enough to be able to reach out uh, and provide uh, some of the support that people need that are much more social services. Whereas when you are part of a larger group, uh, especially one that's run well, it's so much more obvious uh, what the needs are. Uh, and there are a lot of examples that you can find around the country uh, where uh, some of the um, larger uh, capitated systems have made explicit attempts to reach out to the community uh, to involve them when they're working with their patients so that when you have food issues, food insecurity, uh, or you have safety issues going on in the family, that they can reach out. They don't try, and they shouldn't probably, to actually deliver the service, uh, but they can bring in the people in the community who know how to deliver that. Again, it's not that it's impossible for a small group of physicians uh, providing uh, single specialty care uh, to see some of those problems, uh, but the challenges uh, of trying to acknowledge that part of the delivery system uh, is very, very hard uh, if you're one of a group of uh, four or five uh, cardiologists or radiologists. Uh, and it's not that uh, they would, don't want to take the best care of their patients that they can. They're just not in a good position, and they're not positioned to be in a good position to do that. So, so um, just to point out what you've heard is sort of three sets of insights about where we um, got to with the Affordable Care Act, the work that lay ahead, obviously making the insurance reforms work uh, or work better, 
uh, and tackling what we, I, I think those of us at least up here would agree was the really hard stuff, which is actually making the delivery of health care uh, uh, better. And, and, and I, I would say the, the, the hope was that with the passage of the law in 2010, um, those of us who spent a lot of time thinking about insurance could stop thinking about insurance and start thinking about, uh, you know, other aspects of the problem. So I've asked Dean um, to sort of, um, uh, as they say in Washington, pivot us <laughs> from <laughs> between this part of the discussion and essentially what was happening uh, culminating obviously in the election um, and then we'll come back around to the American Health Care Act but sort of this whole second train of thought about what to what to do next and the, the background for where we find ourselves now okay great well well thank you and again thank you for having me today I'm honored to be on this panel um, so it's sort of an interesting time because I think when the when Sarah asked us to do the panel. I think we had all thought we might be talking about, you know, a, a, a new law that had passed and taken the place of something else. And I think last week as we were planning, we thought we'd probably be here, you know, sort of doing a postmortem on that. And now we're sort of talking about a patient who's still in, you know, the, some form and whether it's going to rise like Lazarus or, you know, or not. <laughs> see. But, um, but, but how, how I think what I guess I, I'll do is maybe just explain a little bit about why, why we're here and why the Republicans in particular have sort of never really bought into the, um, the Affordable Care Act and, and why it was difficult for them to get to the place they even got to um, this week. Um, and, and then we can all talk about where it's all going. But, um, but, but I, think, I think first of all, um, you know, this was a – the Affordable Care Act – um, I, I think we all have to remember is not the only way, um, maybe the best way according to some, it may not be the best way, but it's not the only way uh, to, to reform the health care system. And I um, would say I, I agree with, with Gail that most of the thrust of it was doing the very difficult work of getting to coverage and insurance market reform. So I think just putting aside what Gail just talked about was the uh, I think kind of modest attempts at delivery system reform uh, in the programs um, where there's less disagreement and where I think the reforms attempted were, again, a little bit more um, uh, incremental, um, but around the coverage reform. The, the party that's now in charge never bought into it. In part, um, you can say they took a lot of the Republican ideas, but they were Republican ideas for folks that, you know, Gail and I used to work for, uh, would now would probably be um, folks you would consider moderate Democrats. Um, and, you know, and... <laughs> In addition to that, um, you know, I think put it together on a, on a chassis that looked very different than a lot of those Republicans or conservatives would even envision, the significant expansions of Medicaid and the type of, um, you know, onerous uh, or overly prescriptive um, federal regulation of, of what had been kind of state insurance markets, not the only way uh, to sort of get to coverage. So, uh, we're, we're in part, why did the House vote, whatever it was, 56 times uh, or 60 times to round it off to repeal the bill before is that, number one, th this isn't philosophically what Republicans viewed as sort of reform, at least the current Republican Party. Number two, um, uh, the politics of it, which you, you are really hard to divorce, as we're learning from the policy here, um, were such that, for whatever reason, you can blame the Republicans for walking away from the table, or you can blame the Democrats for not, you know, or for letting them walk away from the table. But the fact is that this was a, a significant piece of social policy that passed with only one party uh, in 2010, and that uh, I think is a, is not a prescription for sort of durable change on these big, big items. Uh, and so Republicans never saw this as something that they bought into. Uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, in, in a lot of these big changes, whether it be Medicare or Medicare prescription drugs or HIPAA or other things, you had a, at least some segment of the minority party that was going along. And in this case, you didn't. You can say it's their fault, but they didn't. Um, and, then, and then also there was a fifth element beyond the, the four pillars that Sarah talked about uh, that had to do with financing all of this. So to the, to the, de the Democrats' great credit, unlike the Medicare prescription drug bill, which I worked on when I was in Congress and we didn't offset the cost of, the Democrats offset the, at the time, trillion dollar or so cost of the expansion of coverage um, through a combination of tax increases and, and provider cuts. Um, and the tax increases 
um, were things that the party that's now in charge never really bought into, like limitations on health savings accounts, which as you know, you know, we love, and uh, limitations on flexible spending accounts, which as you know, we love, and taxes on, um, you know, on the insurance industry's premiums, which they viewed as, as actually contributing uh, to, the, to the cost. So you have political, philosophical, and other reasons that led to it. And then I, the only thing I would take a little bit of exception to uh, in terms of Sabrina's comments earlier is, well, where you can say that the law is not collapsing, um, I, I think when, when you look at it, my, my view of the world, and I think this echoes a lot of the Republicans' views of the world, even though they, they may say it's collapsing across the country, is that it, it is not, at a minimum, the, the Affordable Care Act is not doing well uh, in many, many markets across the country. It's doing very well in some. Um, and, and they have all different characteristics. I mean, California is a very blue state, a lot of regulations, standard plans and everything, and the California market, I think, is doing relatively well. But you look at a blue state like Minnesota, and a Democratic governor, Mark Dayton, has basically said that, you know, the laws, I don't think he quite said collapsing, but not doing well. And Arizona, which is a red to purple state, I think it's kind of a red state, where it's an odd state. You had a Medicaid expansion under a Republican governor and you had a market that was doing pretty well um, where um, you know the market premium increases were 30, 40, 50, 60 percent and I, I know because the Blue Cross plan there is one of my clients they struggled mightily to stay in the market at a time when you know um, nobody thought Donald Trump was going to be president of the United States um, and, and you saw the announcements by, by others uh, before that so I, I do think some of the, the um, uh, Republican uncertainty about funding cost sharing reduction subsidies and, continu and continuing the market is creating, there's no question, a period of instability that's causing um, plans to say, I'm just not worth it for me to be there. Um, but you had a great deal, in my view, of instability before. So when you put those things together, um, these individual states that are, you know, if you're looking at the two Republican senators from Arizona that are, that are seeing one plan in many, many of their counties and that plan struggling to stay there, if you're seeing the way the bill passed politically uh, and the philosophy and the other things. So that's how we got here to begin with and why the Republicans just sort of, you know, hated the thing, even though the Democrats will say, well, we took Republican ideas and we put them in the, the bill. This was your bill back in the 1980s or 1990s. Um, and, and, then, and then the second thing I want to say as a pivot, um, maybe to set up the substantive discussion, is um, why the American Health Care Act sort of got quickly to where it got to, which is, and I, I think a lot of folks understand this, but it, it does appear that even members of Congress don't completely understand what I'm about to say, so I, I think it's probably worth repeating, which is that the, there's, you know, 52 Republican senators, um, and that's not enough to pass things given the filibuster rule, and so there is a way to pass changes in Congress with 51 votes in the Senate, and that's through budget reconciliation process. And that's what they're trying to do. But the budget reconciliation rules um, basically say that uh, you can only affect change, and you know, real budget people here on this panel will tell me that this is overly simplistic, but you can only affect change by, by um, changing provisions that primary goal of which is to change budget numbers. So things like repealing all the Affordable Care Act taxes, that's kosher, and things like changing some of the insurance market rules where they're not having a big budget impact, that's not kosher. So the Republicans are in this position of, we voted on this thing to repeal it a bunch of times, we actually passed a bill that got through all the parliamentarian budget hurdles in 2015, and if it wasn't for Barack Obama vetoing the bill, we would have passed it before, and so I think the plan was, well, this will be easy. Um, you know, we passed this thing a bunch of times. We have a bill that we passed in 2015. The one thing that changed is we now have a Republican president who will sign it. Let's just do that again. Um, and as they went about it, there were, there were a couple of complications. One is there was a recognition that they were now politically going to own those changes in a way that they were not going to necessarily own it when they knew that the president was going to veto it. So they couldn't just afford to repeal everything. Um, they also had to simultaneously try to replace some of the provisions. And so if they just would have repealed it 
um, they probably could have gotten all the conservative votes. And if they just would have, you know, replaced it, they could have gotten a lot more moderate votes, votes. But they had to try to do both. And they had to do both against a very difficult backdrop where they could only touch certain provisions because of the budget rules. They could repeal the Medicaid expansion. They could, um, you know, repeal all the taxes. They could put in place new tax credits, which they tried to do. Um, but they couldn't alter the insurance reforms. And that really, if you look at, at the basis of it, um, was the holdup, even though I think the leadership's view was that at the end of the day, uh, kind of the siren song of repeal was going to be enough to persuade all the doubters to do this, that there was a balance between we can't be irresponsible and just repeal it and say we're going to deal with it in a couple years. We have to do something now to send a signal to the market uh, that there's going to be some stability and some transition. And the replacement provisions upended the conservatives who wanted to repeal the thing root and branch, and, and, and you know, root alone wasn't enough. And, um, and for the moderates, when they saw the coverage numbers, uh, where I think the Congressional Budget Office analysis and other things mattered, and they saw that, you know, 24 million people estimated were going to lose their coverage, uh, that became, uh, you know, that became a real challenge. And so how they squared that circle, and what's interesting now is the kinds of things that, that the, the so-called Freedom Caucus wants to change. If you look at the debate, and you probably this article you read at 7 in the morning, was, you know, the idea of, um, well, let's get rid of a lot of the insurance reforms in the bill and then the conservatives will go along and vote for it. Or let's change the rules around essential health benefits and conservatives will vote for it. Or let's provide a waiver and conservatives will vote for it. A lot of those things will probably mean that that bill can't pass the Senate, uh, not just politically, but procedurally will lose some of the budget protections that makes it possible to pass on 51 votes. So that's in part why uh, it's incredibly difficult. And with that, we'll talk about where we're going. So, okay. so great. So let, let me just um, note, I mean, basically, Dean has brought us up to the current moment. And I think it's worth um, one more lightning round before we open it up for questions, which is um, the, the, the present. That is the American Health Care Act that sort of imploded uh, about 10 days ago now, uh, and thinking back to the point that um, uh, Diane Gale and Sabrina made, um, uh, and I throw it out to the three of you uh, for 30 seconds on would that act have dealt with the issues that you were, that you identified? No, and it wouldn't have even dealt with the issues of the insured, which was the uh, thing that was going to catch them for sure in the Senate. Uh, I don't know if the CBO numbers uh, were correct, but they were directionally correct. That is, a lot more uninsured people uh, were going to result. Uh, so we've all talked, or at least I was talking specifically, we've gotten major forward progress on the coverage. We're not doing so well on the hard stuff. If that had passed, we would have taken a giant step back in terms of the coverage. You can't not have income-related subsidies. You know, certainly I think what we saw with the, the attempt was that when you cover people, it's easier to repeal a law before, like they did with Medicare catastrophic, before it goes into effect. And so the number of people and the public opinion out there was so strongly turning to be more supportive. But I think that you also saw the governors who had expanded who said, well, you know, we need this expansion. So that's another piece of once it's implemented, it's harder to roll it back. But I think the other thing that they did, of course, was to get savings on the Medicaid side. They pushed too hard and too far to have $880 billion worth of savings projected for the Medicaid program, which is a 25% reduction in 2026. And that turned almost all the governors against them. They want flexibility, but they don't want their fiscal um, abilities to be compromised by some flexibility to do more with less. So on Medicaid, it wasn't just about the ACA provisions. It became about the entire program, which was uh, you know, one of the more remarkable aspects of the, of the replacement bill. And I think one of the interesting things that came out of that was the fact that all of a sudden a lot of people got educated, not just about the expansion, which had been the focus of most of the reporting and debate, 
but they kept calling and saying, what do you mean 74 million people are on the Medicaid program? What do you mean the Medicaid program does all of this stuff? So I think, as one of the other New York Times articles said, is Medicaid's gotten a lot more visibility and understanding than it ever had before, which may make it harder to change it in the future. Yeah, AHCA was just a bad bill, and, and uh, I don't think there's many people even in on, uh, even in the Republican Party that would necessarily disagree with that. What I would say, though, is while I think many of us did celebrate its being pulled from the floor, um, there, there is a real concern that without some action on the part of this Congress, um, the individual marketplaces are going to collapse. The, 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 it will become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, and there are a number of levers at the Trump administration's disposal, particularly around some of the subsidies um, that are flowing to insurers right now that could be shut off. Um, just the general uncertainty that the debate has generated, I think, could, could cause a number of insurers, and we're already starting to see that, to just pull away and say, I've had enough. Um, so we are going to need to see Congress do something, if, even if it's just to say, we're, we're done, we're leaving it alone, we're going to leave it to Secretary Price to tell, you know, so at least uh, the carriers can get a message that, like, this is a safe place to operate at least for 2018, because right now they, they don't feel it's a safe place. Yeah, no, my, my, my uh, I, I, I texted to the dean this morning that, um, that one of my theories behind this constant um, revisiting of we're negotiating, we're negotiating, we're negotiating, is uh, p whether it's intentional or just has that effect to sort of further destabilize things and, and has a spillover effect onto Medicaid as well. Um, if you uh, read Governor Brownback's veto message, although he may be someone who's moving on, this sentiment that, well, it's really not a good time to expand Medicaid because they're, they may be taking the money away. So it just sort of adds to this air of instability. And, and particularly, yeah, Gail made the point in another meeting yesterday that Medicaid, for all of its um, uh, uh, you know, complexities, is in, in many ways much more durable than an individual insurance market because individual insurance markets are very fragile things. They're very hard to keep going. Medicaid acts like insurance, but it doesn't play by the rules of commercial insurance. So you can push it around and make it do all kinds of things that you can't with the individual market. And I think the individual market is what's really quite vulnerable. Right. And the only other thing I would add is that insurance companies have to make these decisions within the next Yes, two yeah. months. Is it two months, two exactly. Months. So it's um, these are very, very critical issues, and there's a very limited time to deal with them. Yeah, I, I must say, and I'll be one t five more seconds for the law students in the audience. Um, one of the interesting sidebars is the resolution of a very high-profile case involving whether President Obama had the legal authority to spend money on the cost-sharing subsidies, and nobody seems to want to blink and basically say, yeah, you know what, the judge has left the cost-sharing subsidies in place while we're fighting over this question of whether the president overstepped his constitutional authority. Um, uh, sort of everybody knows the subsidies have to continue or the insurers will pull out. It's about, what, $7 billion in subsidies. Uh, uh, you know, nobody wants the first one, be the first one to say, yeah, 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 let's, let's leave everything alone. So let me open it up to questions. We have about 10 minutes for questions. Yeah. OMB for scoring. And the second part of the question is um, 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 uh, uh, President Obama gave a lot of uh, control over the Affordable Care Act to HSS, HHS. What powers does Price have in controlling or impacting the Affordable Care Act? The first thing is that OMB doesn't typically score a congressional, so the Congressional Budget Office, CBO, did the scoring, which is what we mentioned in terms of both 
the budgetary impact and the number of people who would lose insurance. Um, and on, certainly on the Medicaid side, there's been a lot of um, talk about the fact that there's going to be a much more waiver-friendly administration um, in terms of granting more waivers under the Medicaid program, maybe even granting some waivers that help some of the non-expansion states come in and to change some of the Medicaid requirements. But on the yep. And I would just say, um, uh, to your first question, um, while the CBO did score the first version of the AHCA, I believe it was going to the floor two, was it two Fridays ago with some changes that I don't believe at least there had been no published score that, that uh, members had seen prior to that vote being pulled, but, uh, that bill being pulled. Um, but Secretary Price has um, a, a fair amount of authority over the, the insurance reforms, but not unlimited. So one um, popular target among um, opponents of the ACA are the essential health benefits package, um, and that's 10 minimum, 10 categories of coverage that, um, that insurers must have in their plans. Um, those are in statute, so he can't repeal those. However, within those 10 categories, of course, are, are serv items and services, um, and he can certainly um, give, uh, through regulation, he can give either states or insurers uh, more flexibility uh, 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 within those 10 categories. Um, but even there, there are limits because the law does say that the, the um, plan has to be similar to a typical employer-based plan. So if you were to really decimate, say, um, pharmaceutical coverage or, you know, say you only have to cover, <laughs> you know, prescription ibuprofen or something and that's it, um, I, I would say that you would be open to a lawsuit um, saying this is not equivalent to what's, a typical, what's in a typical employer plan. So I think there are limits to how um, much he can weaken those protections. The Congressional Budget Office score is quite interesting, not only because of the, uh, uh, the allusion Gail made to the, this is where you see the, the total number of uninsured people, but also there's a very interesting table that shows you how a 64-year-old with sort of lowish income fares under the Affordable Care Act and how that same person would fare under the American Health Care Act, and you see the startling difference. De Dean, sorry. I was just going to add, I think one interesting thing is, is um, several weeks ago, Secretary Price put forward a proposed rule which uh, has gone over the Office of Management budget, and they'll probably finalize here in the next couple of weeks that would provide some stability or was designed to provide some stability to the insurance markets beyond the subsidy issue, but things like giving the insurers a little bit more flexibility, um, uh, you know, a little bit more time, uh, those kinds of things. And, and I think one question for the administration to wrestle with is, um, you know, assuming that this new round of legislative reform doesn't happen, are they going to be in a political position of wanting to kind of rescue the markets over the next two years or, you know, or see them implode? Um, and if they do, you know, something or they don't do something, you know, where's that blame going to fall? But I think there are some things, as Sabrina said, that they can do on the margin. Um, but there are some other big things they can do um, through 1115 Medicaid waiver authority or through uh, waiver authority under a section called 1332 of the Affordable Care Act if a state is a willing kind of dance partner and wants to come in and propose reform. And they may well provide more flexibility to the states in interpreting that provision and giving states different options to get there than the, uh, than the Obama administration had done. That would be one route they could take if, in fact, the legislative uh, efforts here are derailed. Uh, as an example, um, through guidance rather than regulation, uh, the Obama administration, for purposes of 1332 waivers, uh, did not allow savings from Medicaid and savings in the exchanges to be pooled together even though these are extensions of the same populations, uh, frequently the same people as they move during the course of a year in terms of their income. Uh, it also uh, required um, uh, budget neutrality in each and every year, which is actually a, a pretty harsh rule relative to the normal uh, requirements for Medicaid waivers, uh, which will give you a, a three-year or occasionally even a five-year window. Uh, to be budget neutral on the grounds that the first year may involve some investment to produce the savings that you'll see over time. 
Um, the uh, administration now has clearly uh, signaled both with who they've chosen uh, and with their words that uh, they are looking to be uh, flexible in the use of uh, waivers. And uh, since it's not at all clear to me, even if they get it out of the House, that this legislation gets out of the Senate, um, although you know, it's hard to predict these days, um, we could see a lot of action going on uh, with regard to um, uh, what happens with the waiver authority. And at some point, uh, they're going to have to decide what they do about Medicaid match rates, uh, because what they have now is a very bizarre structure, 90% for the, less, the least poor of the Medicaid population and 50 to 73% uh, for the base Medicaid population. Uh, and that is not a stable permanent structure. What they'll do, I have no idea. Last question for this panel. Uh, hi, Erin Brantley from GW. Um, I'm curious if someone can talk more. It just seems like there's a lot hanging on what the parliamentarian in the Senate would decide is related to the budget or not. So how predictable is that? And if you don't agree, is there some way to challenge their decision? Other than get a new parliamentarian? <laughs> <laughs> Do a new well, well, there is. There is. So the... Um, it, it's it's somewhat predictable based on precedent, um, and and remember that in 2015, um, the, the Senate Republicans and House Republicans spent a lot of time working with the parliamentarian, and and, and I would say that if if you're interested in this, it's actually worth going back and looking at just in the last two years of the legislative history, because what happened was the House passed actually a much more modest bill, um, and then. Uh, Leader McConnell, under pressure from a couple of members who were running for president, like Ted Cruz, said, well, that's not sufficiently conservative enough. We need to repeal a lot more. And so my understanding, and, and Gail may have a, a deeper insight here, but is that the leadership, Republican leadership in Congress spent an awful lot of time having informal conversations with, and formal conversations with the parliamentarian to figure out everything they could possibly repeal. And, and, and in fact, that's what the Senate did, and then the House passed it, and that bill um, is the one in December of 2015 that went to the President Obama, and he vetoed in January. So they, they had, in recent history, a lot of discussion specifically about the Affordable Care Act. And so, um, you know, there is a level of interpretation here um, around things, and, and I remember, you know, we had a lot of discussion when I was um, working for members of Congress who wanted to see medical liability reform, which saved tens of billions of dollars if you capped non-economic damages, but the parliamentarian ruled that the significance of those changes were really about changing the litigation system and not primarily about affecting the budget. So, you know, there, there are some of these decisions that are, that are a gray area, and sometimes you don't know until that bill kind of gets over to the Senate and gets to the floor. So th there's a lot that's known, I would say. There's a lot that's not known. And your question about challenging is actually an interesting one. Um, and there is a process, but it, it's, um, it, it's very risky where you can actually overrule uh, not just fire, you, bless you, you can overrule a parliamentarian. Um, and and you're, you may well see a parallel to that play out in the Supreme Court fight on Friday, yeah. um, where, where, you know, the, it's the same kind of thing. The, the parliamentarian would rule, and then you can go through procedures and you can challenge it. But um, uh, we may see uh, the Republican majority do that around the Supreme Court. They, they desperately don't want to do that because, again, it sets precedent here if one party can do kind of anything they want by changing the rules of the game. So th that's a quick answer, um, but go back and look at that 2015 bill. Thank you very much.
So thanks, what a great panel. Uh, so uh, I'm Leighton Koo, I'm a professor here in the Department of Health Policy and Management and I'm opening up the, the, the second panel as the moderator. Uh, and here we're going to go from uh, things that, that uh, Washington is, is very used to sort of policy and politics discussions. Uh, we're gonna try to focus in a little bit more on some of the repercussions uh, that are associated with on one hand the Affordable Care Act on the other hand, with the you know sort of new notions of repeal, replace, and and there may be additional themes that come up with what happens with the budget, with appropriations, other legislation that may be related, uh, and and we're going to focus on the repercussions uh, in a different perspective. I'm going to start off talking a little about some of the the sort of economic and employment consequences that might occur, and, and then we're going to turn to some of the specific uh, parts of of the health system that exist. Uh, right now and sort of what are, what are the repercussions of what might go on there. Um, and so it's, it's important to remember that, that you know, we're, we're talking now in, in Washington of, of health care and health policy, sort of the usual way you're doing it, it was sort of like a political football or a policy football. But, but in reality, it is, it is uh, just huge. I mean, health care is now uh, about one-sixth of the, of the total U.S. economy. Uh, tens of millions of people are employed within it. Uh, all of us are patients in some manner, shape, or form, or are somehow related to the healthcare system, uh, particularly the audience here, uh, even more so. Uh, and, and so, in this regard, uh, there are broad repercussions that occur uh, across the system. Uh, you know, one of the things that I know that, that, that I was involved with earlier this year, uh, and in fact, we're, we're trying to update it, were some economic and employment analyses of what might happen. Uh, if you repeal the Affordable Care Act, uh, and a study that we released in, in January got a, a fair amount of circulation publicity, uh, found that if you repeal the Medicaid expansions and the tax credits that were associated with, there were, there were very large repercussions. And in part, this was because uh, those were pumping around $140 billion of federal funds in, into states uh, every year. And if you withdraw that money, uh, that about 2.6 to 3 million people might lose their jobs. Uh, and in fact, it, it, oddly enough, this sort of surprised us, was not just people who were in the healthcare system. In fact, actually about two-thirds of, of the employment loss would be outside the healthcare system because there are these, these ripple-through effects uh, across the system uh, in which people in areas like construction, retail trade, finance, uh, as you see that financial contraction, they would be affected too. Uh, the financial cost over five years, we might talk about $1.5 trillion lost in state economies. Uh, so these were fairly serious. Now at that point, we were only looking at the repeal possibilities. We didn't have a good sense of what the replacement options are. We are working on analyses right now, uh, looking at, at the, the last version of the American Health Care Act, the, the thing that always makes me shudder every time I hear about changes. Is, is every time there are changes, then we need to go through and recalibrate all our models and start all over again. Uh, but, you know, that, that, that's, a, that's a, a, a better uh, problem to have. To give you a more local sense of what some of the repercussions are, uh, simply because of the Medicaid changes that were discussed, uh, I, I recently uh, saw some testimony from Wayne Turnage, who's the director of DC's Department of Healthcare Finance, that is the, the agency that runs the Medicaid program, and their estimates were that had that version of the American Health Care Act uh, been enacted, uh, D.C. would have faced a fairly serious problem. On one hand, the additional cost because of the, the changes in the Medicaid structure might have cost D.C. and D.C. alone. D.C., remember, a small jurisdiction in the country, one of the smallest jurisdictions, would have cost the state about $1.7 to $4 billion over five years. 
uh, and additional revenue that it would need to sustain to sustain its Medicaid program. Alternatively, uh, the D.C. might be forced to sort of, uh, you know, cut enrollment by somewhere in the range of starting at around $15,000, possibly escalating to 75,000 people losing health insurance coverage, once again, in a, in a, a jurisdiction that only has about 600,000 people. That's a lot of people who might lose insurance coverage. So, so these repercussions are, are potentially, uh, you know, vast. Uh, so now let me introduce uh, the panel members uh, sitting immediately to my left is, uh, again, as Sarah said, uh, for, for many of these people, they probably don't need any introductions. Uh, Dan Hawkins has uh, often been described as one of the most influential healthcare people in the city, and, and he is a, a durable institution unto himself. He's the senior vice president uh, for public policy and research at the National Association of Community Health Centers, uh, and he's been uh, highly engaged in all issues of policy and support uh, for community-oriented primary care all across the country, uh, a system which now supports health care for around 25 million uh, people. Sitting to his left is, uh, and I should also mention uh, that, that Dan is an adjunct faculty here at GW. Uh, uh, sitting to his immediate left uh, is uh, Beth Feldpush. Beth uh, has a title very similar to Dan. She's the Senior Vice President for Policy and Advocacy at America's Essential Hospitals. I must admit I still have a, a little bit of a difficult time saying that name for so many years the National Association of Public Hospitals, but now they're, they're, they're America's Essential Hospitals. So Beth uh, functions again to, to support uh, policy uh, and improvements for the safety net hospitals that provide inpatient emergency care as well as other you know, primary care and specialty care services uh, all across the country. Uh, Beth, I will add, is uh, one of our alumni. Uh, Beth got her doctorate here, so we're, we're especially proud of, of Beth and the achievements that she's done. And then she is also uh, an adjunct faculty person. And uh, sitting to her left uh, is Mila Kaufman. Uh, Mila is uh, the executive director of the District of Columbia's Health Benefits Exchange Authority. Uh, of which I should, should add, just so there's no conflict. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a board member there, so every now and then in my career I've wondered, does Mila work for me or do I work for Mila? And it's never been entirely clear to me. I suspect it's more <laughs> the latter than the former. Uh, but anyway, so, so Mila has led uh, one of the successful health insurance exchanges across the country, has a good sense of, of what is going on in this, in addition to being uh, the, the director of DC's health insurance exchange, uh, she's also a former insurance commissioner for the state of Maine, uh, a former uh, faculty person at Georgetown University. Uh, so Mila is both well known as uh, a, a, an experienced, uh, you know, uh, regulator uh, and administrator, and also a, a, as a research and, and, and expert in her own right. Last but certainly not least uh, is Adam Sonfield. Uh, Adam is the senior policy manager at the Guttmacher Institute, which is the leading uh, uh, research institution and analysis institution that deals with reproductive health care, both in the U.S. and abroad. Uh, and so uh, Adam has been involved highly in understanding and analyzing uh, issues that affect reproductive health care, particularly family planning services. Uh, in the U.S., he's the executive editor uh, of the Guttmacher Policy Review, uh, certainly a well-known expert in, in this area. So what I'm going to ask, uh, I think the order will be, uh, first we'll ask uh, Dan to say a few words, uh, then Beth, then Adam, and then finally Meal at the end. Uh, once again, we're going to, I asked each of them to, to speak relatively briefly for a few minutes, uh, so we have lots of time for questions. Dan. Okay. Thank you, Leighton, and good morning to all of you. Um, we, in 2010, uh, celebrated sig significantly the passage and enactment of the Affordable Care Act. Um, as one who had been here, uh, actually I was out in the field uh, directing a community health center the first time, uh, at least in my lifetime, um, national health insurance crashed. Um, I, I, that was uh, during the Nixon administration, actually. Um, and uh, uh, people don't remember that, but the, the <laughs> Family Health Care Act was a piece of legislation. Actually, it was the harbinger of what was to follow. It was the first time that they proposed sort of a market-oriented private insurance 
focused system of care with public insurance for low income and other folks. But before that, Ted Kennedy had uh, had authored legislation, um, and going back to uh, to literally uh, um, the the um, uh, Roosevelt administration, efforts had been made to uh, in, in, enact something along the lines of national health insurance. In all those cases, it had been through a public system of coverage. In effect, all of us would have been covered uh, by public insurance. Uh, the Nixon option uh, broke that mold. Uh, and from that time forward, I came into D.C. to work with uh, Jimmy Carter in the Carter administration, and he actually produced a, a piece of legislation, the Publicly Guaranteed Health Plan, PGHP, what a lovely name. Um, <clears throat> it was effectively private insurance as well, with a publicly guaranteed fallback, as the name implies. And so on and so forth, it is gone. Uh, and so when uh, President Obama proposed the Affordable Care Act, and it was a mix of private insurance coverage and public coverage for lower income folks, it made eminent sense at that point to embrace that and move forward. What I was thrilled with is that for the first time in almost 100 years, um, uh, Congress and the administration actu had actually taken up legislation to extend insurance coverage to the vast swath of Americans who are uninsured and begin to remake the health care system to work uh, more logically. Uh, so we celebrated it and we were happy. Now there was another reason that we celebrated it and that is that the Affordable Care Act contained a bunch of extra goodies in there besides the private insurance coverage expansion and the Medicaid expansion which was huge for health centers because we see very low income folks, poor and low income uh, individuals. To give you a sense, those 25 million people that health centers serve, 90% uh, uh, of them are either poor, below poverty, or below twice poverty, what are considered low income. Uh, and uh, at that time, in 2010, 40% had Medicaid coverage. Uh, almost as many were uninsured, and the rest had Medicare or private insurance. Um, uh, so the Medicaid expansion was a huge part of the Affordable Care Act that we celebrated uh, and got ready to do, Ellen Murray, who's here, was the uh, uh, Assistant Secretary for Budget. I'm just going to call it Management and Budget. Um, what we used to call ASMB, I forget what the title was. But uh, it, the huge part about this was that um, uh, some of the funding was used to uh, employ outreach workers to go out and help people enroll in coverage. Uh, again, something we really believed in. Uh, and uh, we got very, very busy on that. Um, and it's still going on today, and it sounds like the way things are going with, uh, with uh, Trump care, whatever that's going to be, uh, we may need to, you know, we're going to need to revitalize those folks and get them back out there trying to help people hold on to insurance. So, so that was one part. The other big part of the Affordable Care Act we cared deeply about was that it included $11 billion over five years to expand the reach of health centers. Congress truly understood that if they were going to extend coverage to people, uh, uh, they needed to ensure that with that coverage came a place they could go to get care. Uh, and since most of the folks who were going to gain coverage, especially Medicaid coverage, which you in inevitably hear is a, um, the worst form of insurance coverage, I will tell you that's absolutely not true. It's the opposite, in fact. Um, the, but these people would need a place to go. And so let's expand health centers, which have the experience and the interest in serving that population. Um, that money was parsed out over five years, expired in 2015. Fortunately, during that time, Congress extended it through the end of this fiscal year, 2017. Um, at, and so uh, it, that money has enabled health centers to expand the number of people served, to grow the scope of services, to add oral health care, mental health care, behavioral health care, other kinds of public health care, in addition to primary medical care. Uh, and so that was a huge part of that. That said, uh, I will just say the, the second time we rejoiced 
uh, as being over the moon was a week ago last Thursday when uh, Congress polled the legislation that would have, by and large, largely undone the Affordable Care Act uh, because it would have been, <coughs> excuse me, a disaster, most importantly for the people that health centers, at least, we all care about, uh, and to a lesser extent, but still importantly, for the health centers themselves. Um, the rollback of Medicaid expansion, the um, uh, changing in the rules of the game uh, for the purchase of private insurance coverage, those kinds of things that were part of the American Health Care Act were and are anathema to us. And so we are watching the, this never-ending story. Um, you know, it's, it, it feel like we're watching uh, Terminator 2. He's dead. He's coming back. He's dead. He's coming back. <laughs> um, uh, it, well, yeah, we, we all want to believe that it's dead, um, except that it keeps rearing its ugly head. Um, so that one is then part of the never-ending story. Who knows how far or where it's going to go. Um, that's where we stand right now. So let me turn it over to Beth. Thanks, Dan. Um, so I represent Essential Hospitals, which were previously known as public hospitals, uh, more generally known as safety net hospitals. You know, when you look at hospitals across the U.S., there's a couple of different types of providers that you could consider to be safety net hospitals. There are those that primarily serve an urban um, area and those that serve more of a rural area. My membership reflects the urban hospitals by and large. And the distinction between um, the urban and rural safety nets is largely in the breadth of the services they provide. So our hospital's patients are largely low income, uninsured, underinsured. Um, greater than 50% of our patients are either Medicaid or uninsured on average. Um, good bit of Medicare patients, very, very small commercial base. I have a hospital in Texas, 2% uh, of their patient base is commercially insured. So what I'm trying to um, set up by saying, looking at kind of the, who the patients are and where that funding stream is, is our hospitals to serve their mission of caring for those vulnerable patients really have to piece funding streams together between Medicaid, um, some local support, obviously some uh, paying folks from Medicare and, and the small commercial base, um, but it's pretty hard to make ends meet. And so, you know, no margin, no mission is something that we pay very careful attention to as we see healthcare reform efforts play out. Um, Dan talked about when the Affordable Care Act was passed, um, and we very much strongly supported the passage of that bill and were strong advocates for it. Um, it did contain a whole lot of really great things for patients. And our hospitals really um, saw the benefit of that in their communities. Folks that had not had insurance received it. Um, we had, in, in many places, a more stable uh, patient base. But there were underlying hospital cuts, 155 billion of them, baked into the Affordable Care Act. And that's a little important backdrop when we look ahead to health care reform, because in the AHCA and any discussions kind of moving forward, that money by and large, with the exception of Medicaid dish funding, is never coming back to hospitals. So as we look ahead to potential destabilization and rise in premiums, rise in the uninsured again, for hospitals, we're kind of keeping in the back of our mind that when the Affordable Care Act was passed, there was a balance struck between, all right, if you have more folks that are now paying and have insurance, we're going to cut some of your funding that otherwise would have funded paying for care for folks that are uninsured. Um, we took that balance. We supported that balance but we're never going to get that money back. So we're sort of off balance as a hospital field moving forward in future, re future reforms. Um, we were very concerned about what was in the HCA. Um, as we, you know, Trump care, we called it on our office, we don't care. Um, and, and, you know, really felt that we were going to unwind a lot of the progress that we had been able to make with our patients by getting them in to get um, primary care, connected to doctors, and um, the ability to access specialty services as well. So as I kind of mentioned, our hospitals are large urban providers. In addition then to, sh to caring for those low income, they also provide trauma care. They um, are large teaching institutions. We represent about 300 hospitals out of 3,800 acute care hospitals in the U.S. We train, we formally train over a third of all physicians. 
um, and many more come through the door in one rotation or another. Um, we also uh, have a very large ambulatory footprint. So um, Dan's providers, his health centers, do a fabulous job of taking care of primary care needs for patients. When you've got somebody that has diabetes and COPD and congestive heart failure and some mental health issues on top of it, that's when they tend to come into our specialty clinics that are managed um, at the hospital. So we work very much in partnership with community health centers. Um, in general, we take care of the folks that have even higher acute care needs. So, um, yeah, looking ahead, you know, I think there's a lot of uncertainty. We were also um, breathed a big sigh of relief uh, last week, a week and a half ago, uh, when the AHCA was pulled. Um, but concerned, you know, there's been, been stories about revival of it kind of coming back. Um, and even if, you know, the current bill or the bill we saw last week uh, doesn't move forward, and it's, we know that there's going to be continued discussions around um, reshaping health care. And, uh, you know, we strongly... Uh, urge policymakers to not unwind the progress that was made to date in getting folks covered. Um, you know, it's always hard to see if coverage makes a difference in lives, um, and, and I think you take, it takes a lot of years to show that, um, but we, we know that anecdotally, folks um, feel much more secure, and when they have a regular source of care, um, it takes the burden off of folks that are struggling with other uh, issues around income, security, food security, and housing. So, um, you know, looking ahead, we hope we're going to keep uh, the status quo as we have it. Um, that said, there's still another set of hospital cuts that are going to go into effect this fall unless Congress intervenes. Um, so we're going to continue our advocacy push to make sure that our funding continues so that we can fulfill those missions. Um, hospitals, in addition to being a Large providers of care are often one of the larger, if not the largest, employers in their community, um, particularly in these low-income communities. So um, it's very important that you know, we have that funding not only to provide care to the community, but also to keep them employed. We have uh, jobs that really have a wide range among skill sets. Um, we employ a lot of folks who otherwise wouldn't be able to find a job. And those hospital jobs also come with health insurance. So when folks lose their jobs, they may also lose um, coverage as well, kind of ironically. Um, so I think that's uh, pretty much where I'll leave it for now, but uh, we are staying vigilant. So, thank you. Hi, everyone. I guess we sat in the wrong order here today. Um, so I'm coming at this, uh, all of this from a, a bit of a different perspective. Uh, I, I represent the Guttmacher Institute. We focus on reproductive health care, um, and so that's... Um, Thinking about the the people who in this country who need it, particularly lower income, um, you know, women and men and, and adolescents, and also the safety net providers that offer that care and make it affordable and, and make it accessible for for the people who need it. Um, and the Affordable Care Act has been um, immensely helpful on 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 those fronts. And the attacks that we've seen um, under this Congress, under th um, this administration, um, in terms of attacks on the ACA, attacks on Medicaid, attacks um, on, the fam on providers such as Planned Parenthood, all of which were rolled into the American Health Care Act, um, would be pretty devastating uh, for reproductive health. Um, and part of that is because um, what we've seen over the last number of years has been expansion in who has coverage, improvements in that coverage in terms of how it affects uh, reproductive health care, and um, in improvements in terms of being able to access um, reproductive health care providers. And all those pieces are, are in danger right now. On, on the coverage front, you know, coverage writ large, um, the percentage of women of reproductive age who are uninsured in this country dropped by more than a third between 2013 and 2015 as the big ACA expansions to Medicaid and private insurance took effect. Um, and that means more women and men and adolescents um, have coverage for all the care they need, including reproductive health care. And I'll get to that in a second in terms of the specific requirements around that. Um, but, you know, coverage writ large is now under attack. Um, there's been, uh, you know, attempts to roll back the big Medicaid expansion. 
attempts to reshape Medicaid more broadly. It has nothing really to do with the ACA, but they put it into the American Health Care Act anyway in terms of putting caps on federal reimbursement for Medicaid, which would have the effect of forcing states to roll back enrollment and to roll back benefits and to roll back payments to providers. Um, also, they've been um, obviously t a lot of talk about rolling back the subsidies in the private insurance market and otherwise destabilizing those, those private marketplaces, which would, again, roll back coverage. And so that really could erase some of the gains that we've seen in, in recent years. Um, on the, specifically in terms of reproductive health care, um, the ACA and, and Medicaid law from even well before the ACA really have provided a, a very solid floor of coverage um, all around the country for most reproductive health services. So under Medicaid, dating back to the 70s, um, all states have to cover family planning services in their programs, they have to do so without any out-of-pocket costs for patients, to do so in a way that isn't coercive. Um, and there are similar requirements because of the ACA now that affect private insurance plans nationwide. Um, you know, that you hear about the birth control benefit, which requires coverage of 18 specific um, methods of contraception used by women um, in, in almost all private insurance plans in this country. Um, you see the same type of thing with maternity coverage. Medicaid has long required coverage of maternity care, so prenatal care and labor and delivery and um, postpartum care. Um, and the ACA filled one of the big gaps in maternity coverage in the private insurance market as well as part of the essential health benefits package. Um, that's one of the 10 categories of maternity coverage. Um, and um, Medicaid and private plans also cover a wide range of other reproductive health services, um, screening and counseling around STIs and, and including HIV, um, uh, cervical cancer prevention, inter, in, uh, intimate partner violence screening. Um, you know, the, the one spot where, where Medicaid and private insurance really are not particularly great on right now is, a, is coverage of abortion. Um, you know, federal law prohibits uh, federal dollars from going towards um, abortion coverage under Medicaid and most other federal programs, except in some pretty extreme circumstances. Um, states at this point um, are more than half, about half the states are banning coverage of abortion in at least some of the private insurance plans they regulate. Um, you know, that said, um, right now, conservatives are looking to make the abortion coverage situation even worse. The American Health Care Act would have effectively banned abortion coverage in, um, in the individual insurance market. Um, it would have um, rolled back a lot of these other protections that we're talking about. The last part of that deal that, that um, at the, you know, during the last, last couple of hours would have rolled back the essential health benefit package, including maternity coverage, which has been very explicitly attacked by many conservatives this year. Um, you know, the Medicaid block grant option was part of the, of the AHCA, um, would have allowed states to pretty much um, ignore almost all the current uh, federal Medicaid requirements, including, um, you know, things like coverage for family planning services. Um, and um, even putting aside um, what Congress can do, um, the Trump administration by itself can do a lot of damage to some of the current um, requirements, including um, getting rid of the birth control benefit entirely or drastically undermining it, and they don't need Congress's help for that, uh, just based on the way the ACA was written. Um, so there's a lot of issues there about what is covered. There's also a lot of issues about um, where you can go to get um, services. Um, the ACA was very important for safety net family planning providers, just like it was for um, community health centers and, and for public hospitals. Um, there, um, you know, our clinics are not nearly as favored as the as the community health centers are by by Congress, um, and there's been a lot of uh, talk about um, trying to defund um, Planned Parenthood and other family planning clinics that have um, any ties to abortion. Sometimes even if they just counsel um, about abortion, um, and. That is uh, certainly was one of the goals of the American Health Care Act was to specifically um, kick Planned Parenthood out of the Medicaid program and, and keep people from going to their provider of choice. Um, 
right now there are protections against that sort of thing, protections against the federal government um, doing that on its own or state governments uh, doing that on, on its own to, to kick um, Planned Parenthood out of, out of uh, Medicaid. There, um, part of that is through Medicaid law, which requires that enrollees be able to go to the family planning provider of their choice, um, even if they are otherwise in a, in a closed managed care network under Medicaid. Um, that is a protection that is in place to ensure that they have access to the safety net providers, uh, particularly since there are some networks that really don't want to contract with them. Um, and, um, you know, that, that protection is in danger right now. It was certainly in danger under the, under the American Health Care Act. Um, it's also true that there are important network adequacy requirements that affect um, all the types of providers we've been talking about um, under Medicaid and under private insurance. Um, you know, the, the ACA included a provision um, requiring uh, marketplace plans to contract with what they call essential community providers, which includes a wide range of different safety net providers, including FQHCs and including family planning clinics. Um, all those types of protections are in danger right now, um, as is, frankly, some of the, the other types of grant funding that we have, um, such as the Title X National Family Planning Program, which the House has voted to um, zero out for many years running. Um, and, uh, you know, we have a lot of um, fear that under this um, Congress and this administration that that program could be eliminated or, or severely damaged. I think I should stop now and pass it over to, to Mila. Well, on that positive note, <laughs> thank you, Adam. And just to be clear, Leighton, I work for you. Um, appreciate the introduction. <laughs> um, so uh, first, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the Health Benefit Exchange Authority and specifically DC HealthLink, the online health insurance marketplace here in the District of Columbia. Then I want to talk for a few minutes about what um, the current administration can do to further destabilize and in some cases even destroy private health insurance markets as we know it. And then I'll, I'll finish by talking a little bit about uh, legislative efforts that we haven't talked about yet today um, unrelated to the repeal effort. Uh, so first, a little bit about us. Um, we are a private public partnership here in, in D.C. We have a private executive board. Layton is a member. Um, uh, in D.C., the Affordable Care Act has worked very well. We have now more than 96% of our population covered, either because of the Medicaid expansion or because people now have private health insurance that that they didn't have before. So because of the Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, the ACA, we are close to universal coverage in the District of Columbia. And in fact, uh, in a study that Leighton helped lead last spring, we learned that not only individuals gain coverage on the individual marketplace side, but also many of our small business customers were offering coverage for the first time. For, uh, four out of 10 small business employers reported that they did not offer coverage before here in DC. Uh, we are very proud of, uh, of uh, uh, getting people insured and offering them very good coverage. We're also very proud of um, the kind of market competition we've been able to create here. Uh, we have uh, essentially we require everyone to come through us. Uh, all individual coverage and all small group coverage is sold through DC HealthLink, which means we've been able to create competition in the private market where it hasn't existed before, uh, where everything is transparent and small businesses and individual consumers could actually see prices and benefits and compare and make wise decisions. Uh, and so that forces uh, the private market insurers to actually compete based on price and in some cases even on quality and I'd like to see obviously more quality based competition. On the small group side, we have three United companies, we have two Aetna companies, we have Kaiser and Care First, all offering 151 different products to our small businesses. And in terms of price competition, this year alone we saw many price d decreases. Uh, in, in fact, one um, health plant, one carrier lowered their small group price by 19% for one of their products. So we've seen a lot of price decreases on the small group side. On the individual 
individual side, we have 20 different health uh, products offered by Kaiser and Care First. Uh, prices have gone up uh, higher than we would have liked, uh, but at the at DC HealthLink, we advocate for our customers. We hire our own actuaries and we provide input on the proposed rates every year to the insurance department. Uh, I have to say the timing of this forum is very um, uh, uh, is is excellent not only because um, the repeal effort I guess is not dead anymore, um, uh, but also because uh, the the Trump administration uh, is contemplating many changes uh, to regulations that will uh, adversely and severely impact uh, many states. Uh, and I'll just talk a little bit about some of the things uh, in the proposed regulations called the market stabilization regulation, which actually should be titled destabilization regulation because of the uh, potential adverse impact that it could have in many states, including D.C. And, and I agree with Sarah. I think she mentioned D.C. as a state, and I completely agree with that. <laughs> um, so um, things in the proposed uh, uh, stabilization regulation. Uh, the Trump administration would like to uh, require additional uh, verifications to be applied to people who come in through a special enrollment period. That is, anyone who doesn't come in during open enrollment and they qualify either because they get married, move into a, a jurisdiction, or for any other reason, lose their job, lose their coverage. Uh, so the, the Trump administration would like to require those folks to submit uh, more paperwork to prove that they're eligible. So what that means in D.C. and in some other states is that people who are healthy and who are young aren't going to want to go through the hassle of additional paperwork. They're just not. And I'll give you some data because facts still do matter, I think. Um, looking at 2016, uh, our population who came in through a special enrollment period versus open enrollment period, 45% who came through a SEP uh, were ages 26 to 34 year olds. Uh, people who came in during open enrollment in 2016, 36% were in the same category. So age is just a proxy for health, everyone knows that. So if the Trump administration forces every state to require more verifications of this population, it is certain that we will lose some of our healthy and young enrollees. And what that means for the stability of the insurance risk pool is that it will become more unstable as younger people and healthier people decide not to participate. Uh, of course, if you're uh, unhealthy, if you're very sick, you're going to provide all the paperwork in the world, right, to get coverage. Um, another example of, uh, of adverse uh, impact through proposed regulations, if in fact they're finalized, is a new requirement uh, for a special enrollment period for people who are getting married. Right now, if you're getting married, you can just come in through a SEP. Uh, well, what the Trump administration would like to do is say that at least one of those people uh, 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 getting married had to have health insurance coverage, uh, coverage within the last 60 days. Um, that's not in the law. That is being made up and read into the requirements, and um, that will also uh, have an adverse impact uh, in many states um, as, as younger people decide to forego coverage. Another uh, troublesome uh, initiative is uh, requiring people who lost their coverage because of non-payment, if they want to come in during open enrollment, that those people have to pay back their premiums uh, for the past year. Well, I can tell you again, based on data and facts, uh, people who were terminated uh, from DC HealthLink for non-payment 42% were 26 to 34 year olds. I can guarantee you that most of those people are not going to have thousands of dollars to pay back their insurance company for prior year's coverage. Uh, and in fact, it's, it's a little bit offensive to think about that. They had no coverage. The insurance company didn't pay claims for them. Why should they be forced to pay back thousands of dollars in premiums if they want to be insured the following year. So those are just a few examples of the things that the Trump administration can, can do to destabilize uh, many health insurance markets. 
Sabrina earlier this morning mentioned uh, cost sharing reductions uh, and making necessary payments to insurance companies that insurance companies are expecting to get. Uh, I saw something this morning that an anonymous source out of the Trump administration said they would be paying those cost sharing reductions, which is billions of dollars that the insurance industry is owed. Um, and without that, uh, for some companies, for some insurers, uh, there is a chance that they could be facing the red and obviously insurance companies need to, need to stay solvent. So if, um, if that is true, um, that is great news that will help stabilize our uh, keep um, certain markets stable and will keep uh, insurers uh, in many states from pulling out. It is uncertain whether the Trump administration is going to be forcefully enforcing uh, the individual responsibility requirement. That is also critical to the insurance industry and they make certain assumptions when they build their rates. Uh, and if that requirement is not enforced fully, uh, that's going to have a devastating effect. I can tell you on May 1st, our rates and forms are due and in many states that's, that's the case. And right now, uh, insurance companies are making decisions whether there's enough certainty for them to be in a particular market. Uh, and insurance companies, despite um, of what you may think, they really hate risk. They like certainty because they like to price products based on as much certainty as they can have. So this discourse on the Hill about repeal, potential replace, as well as the many unknowns uh, out of the Trump administration uh, is not helpful to keep markets stable. It is also very stressful for people. And I really haven't talked enough about our customers and people who make decisions every day. Do I leave my job? To, to start my own business if the marketplace or the individual market isn't going to be around for me? Do I just stay with my employer, my employer even though I want to go off on my own? Or do I move to a different state knowing that that state may, not, may choose to not have the same protections as my current state has? So it's, it's very, um, uh, not only for markets, this instability is bad, but also for, uh, for people who are making decisions about their future. Uh, it, it's, it's dangerous for them. Um, I'll, I'll spend just one minute uh, talking about some of the proposals that we haven't talked about. Um, one is uh, association health plans, and that proposal has been around for decades. I think I wrote about it 15 or, tw or 20 years ago. It hasn't changed. It recently passed the House. It's now before the Senate. Uh, but it's essentially allowing association health plans to cherry pick the healthiest of the healthy, offer them coverage, uh, which means that the, the regulated risk pools uh, will become uh, more unhealthy um, if, the, if the healthiest people are, are um, poached. Um, also, these association health plans are nothing more than a way to deregulate uh, the market and preempt um, state insurance regulators from uh, making sure that consumer protections are enforced. Uh, there have been a long history of association health plans associated with fraud and insolvencies. And uh, the bill that passed the House is verbatim the same that actually existed 15 to 20 years ago. Uh, so um, I want to make sure that you're all aware that there are things that Congress can do that are not described as repeal and replace of Obamacare that is just as damaging to the stability of insurance markets and more importantly just as damaging, damaging to, uh, to small businesses and individuals who purchase coverage um, uh, from the private sector. Uh, another uh, bill uh, selling across state lines uh, just, just as damaging because, you know, if you have a problem and you uh, live here, you're going to call your D.C.'s insurance commissioner if your claims aren't getting paid. But if, if uh, companies are allowed to sell across state lines and you're buying a policy out of Texas, um, I can assure you that your call will get returned last because Texas residents will get taken care of first. Uh, so it's highly problematic uh, that uh, proposal will not get to, uh, will not cover more people. It will make coverage cheaper because coverage will be 
meaningless. Um, it, it won't cover uh, potentially the, the kinds of benefits that people need. It, health insurance has to work when you're sick, not just when you're healthy. And those kinds of proposals work when you're healthy, but not when you're sick. And I'll close by um, just uh, uh, highlighting the importance of essential health benefits. Uh, so, you know, when you buy um, insurance, it's not like you're buying a product. It's not like you can test drive, you know, when you're buying a car, you can test drive it, right? When you're buying health insurance, what are you test driving? You're not really test driving it until you use it. And that's when you find out it doesn't work. Now, I can sell you a car without an engine, and it's going to be really cheap, I promise, but it's not going to work. And with health insurance, you buy health insurance that doesn't cover hospitalization. You may think it does, but it doesn't. You're in the hospital with a heart attack. It's too late. Uh, and so the essential health benefits uh, are really critical protections to give meaning to what health insurance is. And, um, and, and many times um, uh, when we think we're getting a great deal because it's cheap, it's cheap for a reason, and with health insurance, it's a matter of life and death. Um, and so uh, I, I encourage all of you to pay a, a especially attention to efforts to undermine essential health benefits and what that would mean for, uh, for, uh, for consumers. So thanks to all of you for, for a great panel. We uh, have uh, about uh, 15 minutes for some questions from the audience, and so I'm sure many of you have questions. Um, thank you for the great panel. Um, I'm Xinxin. I'm um, a, a PhD student in the uh, Department of Health Policy. So I guess I have two questions uh, for the panel. Uh, my first question is about the Brock uh, Grant. Uh, although uh, it won't probably happen in the foreseeable uh, future, but I'm wondering if the uh, Medicaid fund was changed to Brock uh, Grant. Uh, what impact uh, do you think would have on um, safety net hospitals and health centers? And my second question is about managed care utilization and uh, uh, quality of care in health centers. Um, so we all know that uh, most, of, a lot of the uh, Medicaid patients are enrolled uh, in Medicaid through managed care plans. So if the Medicaid expansion were, uh, were, was reversed, um, what do you think uh, it will impact like on managed care utilizations in health centers and how would that affect um, the quality of care in health centers? Thank you. Sure. I'll start on block grants. Um, so yes, so um, some of the policy arguments kind of in shifting away from the current structure of the Medicaid program that we have now um, take one of two approaches. One is a block grant where states would get um, one chunk of money that they could have a lot more liberty around kind of how they use it within their Medicaid program um, and who they use it for and what services they offer. And then there's another proposal that was part of the AHCA um, that is called a per capita cap, which is essentially a block grant, but the money is allocated for each individual. Um, block grant, you just get a pot and good luck. Um, so, you know, on the policy side of it, um, it's, it's a trade-off. Uh, states get a, a certain set of money and then they get more flexibility. Well, the only way that that kind of works on it, on it as a trade-off is if you get more flexibility and that's a, a positive thing, let's say, for a state, um, the, the other end of the deal is that that, that funding in the block grant um, is lower and will definitely get lower, wouldn't grow as much over time. So states would get more flexibility on the policy side, but ultimately end up with less funding. Um, and again, a block grant's pretty inflexible because it doesn't depend on how many folks are enrolled. So if we go into a recession and there's many more folks on Medicaid, um, it doesn't matter, the state doesn't get any more federal money. So if you leave, uh, set aside the state flexibility piece, um, you know, there's, there's policy pros and cons to that, but if you just focus on the fact that every block grant proposal to date eventually takes money and substantial money out of the Medicaid program, um, that's where states 
beneficiaries and providers really run into trouble because states by and large have to balance their budgets. Um, so if they are seeing less federal funding over time in their Medicaid program, that means that they've got to make some pretty tough choices. They either take money out of their general revenue fund um, and support the Medicaid program as they had before. That's not realistic for a lot of states out there. Um, or they have to cut folks off of the Medicaid program offer fewer services or cut provider payment rates, um, all of which result in a decreasing quality of care as well as um, access issues in the Medicaid program. Um, so it's a huge concern. You know, I think politically one of our concerns is that because a lot of those funding cuts happen over a number of years um, as the money kind of slowly drains out of the program, um, that a lot of governors or pol state policymakers may be willing to take this deal up front because they get the benefit of more flexibility in how they structure the program, and the bigger funding cuts are going to be somebody else's problem down the road. Thanks. Uh, just to add a couple of points, um, the Congressional Budget Office, when it did, uh, uh, evaluate the American Health Care Act uh, indicated that the resulting over, over the succeeding 10 years, the result would be 24 million people losing coverage, 14 million of them losing Medicaid. Uh, and we're quite convinced that among those 14 million would be the 4 million health center patients who gained Medicaid coverage, uh, either came in as new patients or were previously uninsured patients who gained coverage. Um, and so we, we see that kind of action, a block grant, oh, that was actually the per capita cap. If it were a block grant, we think it would be even worse uh, uh, impact on the folks. And you know, what's worth mentioning at least is that Medicaid, um, I think in terms of state contribution, Medicaid was never meant to be as heavy a, a contribution on the state's behalf as it is today. When it was a much smaller program, uh, states could contribute their 40 to 50 percent um, and uh, afford that, et cetera. Now today, how many states engage in IGTs or UPLs? I mean, there, oh. there's all, I, I, some want to call those games, but they are, they are creative ways that states use to finance their share of Medicaid. If the federal government is going to pull back on its share of Medicaid, it is highly unlikely that really a single state in the union is going to be able to pick up that slack and keep those people in coverage. So the result would be devastating on first, the people who rely on that coverage who have it today, and then secondly, the safety net providers who strive to serve them. If I can just add from the private market perspective, the reason why uh, if you're a private market person you should care a whole lot about Medicaid expansion is because that childless adult population traditionally has more conditions, uh, traditionally seeks more care, and if those folks become uninsured, then we're back to the days of more cost shifting to the private payers, which means higher rates on the private health insurance side. So it's really important that the two, that you, you understand the two are very related and codependent on each other. If you want to keep private health insurance markets stable, you have to make sure that there is a robust uh, and well-funded Medicaid program. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, excellent panel and for your time today. It's very valued. Um, I'm a fourth-year medical student, um, and one of the things that a lot of the um, you know, medical community has been talking about lately is the shift to, to quality um, and to value-based uh, payment methods. Um, and it seemed like to me implicit in the Affordable Care Act was kind of the promise that we were, as like an American economy, trying to shift um, more of our GDP towards social services and prevention and less of it away from just providing care when illnesses occur, which you're spending a lot of money on. I was curious uh, about your reflections on, um, on, I guess, the GOP's response, um, repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act, whether the ACA truly was trying to move us toward prevention, and if a GOP alternative is going to continue to try that endeavor, or if they're essentially just trying to return us to um, you know, what's been done in the past. Thank you. Yeah. 
You want to take it? I can take it, yeah. Um, so, you know, you're absolutely right, and that's actually one uh, very large section of the Affordable Care Act that really hasn't been up for debate, and I think that's a, a great part. Um, a great thing is that much of the ACA also contains some health care delivery system reforms. Um, those, and a lot of that kind of started in the hospital field because we were sort of the first ones reporting on quality. Um, but a lot of the health care system is moving towards paying for quality. Providers are taking on more risk and responsibility of patient populations. Um, and, and that has continued to got a, a really great kickstart with the ACA and it's really continued to build since then. Um, that was not under discussion during the latest debate in the AHCA. I think, and, and again, I think this is a great thing um, that we've now sort of decided as a society that moving more towards paying for value, um, trying to keep people healthy is inherent in where the healthcare system should be moving. Um, so all of those parts of the ACA were largely left in place. And as we kind of say to our hospitals, um, you know, no matter what you think you may or may not see coming on the coverage or the payment side, the delivery system reform efforts are, are going to continue um, and providers should continue to, to focus on providing high quality care at lower cost um, and, and working with others in their community to um, keep their populations healthy. Yeah, I think. Can I add to that just a bit? Because I, I actually want to um, uh, disagree with Beth just a bit on that um, on two fronts. One is that Secretary Price, um, H uh, Secretary of the, uh, the Health and Human Services, has been very vocal about disliking many aspects of delivery system reform and payment reform. Um, he is a, a, a vowed opponent of many of these initiatives. Um, he feels that they are infringing on the rights of doctors. Um, and so I don't think we can be as sure as that, that HHS is going to continue on all the same paths that they have been doing under the Obama administration there. Um, the second piece I want to talk about is the, the preventive care piece, um, you know, which, uh, yes, the, the ACA has really shifted things a lot towards preventive care in a lot of ways. One big piece of that is requirements that plans cover preventive services and to do so without out-of-pocket costs. And that is absolutely a provision that is under attack still. Um, it was not um, specifically included in the American Health Care Act because, as we were talking about earlier in the morning, the rules around reconciliation, it is absolutely a demand of the Freedom Caucus to repeal that piece of the ACA. And as I mentioned earlier, um, the Secretary has authority to um, do a lot of damage to that provision even without Congress in terms of getting rid of specific um, services from that preventive services requirement, including birth control, but including many other services, uh, preventive services for women and, and for children um, that are not explicitly required by the letter of the law. And I would just like to um, completely agree with Adam and add that um, it's kind of hard to talk about delivery system reform and payment reform when you're kicking 24 million people off coverage. Um, and I'll also say, you know, there is a, a very, you know, explicit uh, philosophy that's emerged and um, Secretary Price and others truly believe and have said this publicly that people should be able to just go and pay cash out of their health savings accounts for, I don't know, heart attacks. That's two, three hundred thousand dollars. I don't know who in this room can do that, but that, that is the philosophy. So when that's what you're promoting, it's again, very hard to talk about delivery reform, how we finance medical care in the future reform efforts. Last point, keep an eye on the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, CMMI, at HHS. To me, that will be the ground zero for uh, payment reform, health service delivery reform, et cetera. They've done a lot of stuff. Some would call it just throwing stuff up against the wall to see what sticks. But that's not a bad thing because nobody really knows what the, the silver bullet is or what the, the best answer is to this thing. Uh, <clears throat> the question is now with the new regime in control, will that change pretty dramatically? Um, if it does, then we're going back to the, I'm not sure we ever went very far forward anyhow, but what little forward progress was made in this, we'll be back to the old days.
Can I just respond quickly one more time? Uh, I agree completely with what you said. Dr. Price certainly has um, had government doctor issues, um, and you're right on the preventive side, but I'm telling you, at least for hospitals, those expectations are there. Nobody, particularly if you are concerned with cutting cost, is going to go back to say, why don't you just tell us what you want to, what do you want to charge for that and we'll pay you for it. We don't care how the outcome is, you know, we don't care if you're driving down your re readmissions rate, that train has left the station and it is never coming back. So thanks, and I think some of those last questions about sort of uh, what the implications were for preventive uh, services are, are important and a good segue into our next panel. Uh, so I, I thank the, the, the members of the panel for, for, for making great contributions both here as well as what they do all the time. the industry has moved away. I mean, that's really it. Yeah, I mean, the private side and the state. <laughs> that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so good to see you. Congratulations. <laughs> Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Hello, how are you? Professor Lorraine. <laughs> yes, that's me. Thank you. Oh, no, okay, good. Thanks. Thank you. Them down. Yeah. Well, good late morning. Um, we're coming down the home stretch here with the third panel of our symposium this morning. I'm Maureen Burns. I'm in the Department of Health Policy and Management here at the Milken Institute School of Public Health, and it's my pleasure to serve as the moderator for this panel. Um, I was thinking over the course of the morning that outside the field of public health or the schools of public health, I think frequently this panel would be referred to the panel that deals with all that other stuff. <laughs> uh, um, and in the field, sometimes it's referred to as the social determinants of health. For many of us in the field of public health and others, what was exciting about the passage of the Affordable Care Act is that, in fact, these issues were not longer thought of as other, but what would the challenge and what would the strategies be for integrating the very principles and practices that we know in the field of public health into our healthcare delivery system. So that over time, as a country, we might move away from thinking just about healthcare delivery and reimbursement, but actually have a health system that had at its heart prevention and wellness. And if that's the case, then we would need to be thinking about how, in fact, would we integrate the very things we knew that we should do when it came to prevention and keeping people well. Um, our panel this morning represents uh, all of the people with lots of colleagues and friends around the country who were quite instrumental in making those provisions in the Affordable Care Act um, happen. And I think it would be interesting to be hearing about the challenges of actually moving on those if there were no political challenges to the Affordable Care Act uh, period. But I think in this time of uncertainty and transition, it's quite useful, I think, to be asking our panelists to help us understand where we are right now in terms of uh, preserving and protecting at least the embracing um, of that vision of the Affordable Care Act and how we might um, move forward. So we're joined this morning um, with Jeff Levy, who is a professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management, the Milken Institute School of Public Health. Um, Jeff has been on the faculty for many years and also um, served for many years as the Executive Director of Trust for America's Health, a DC-based advocacy organization that focuses um, all on public health and issues around prevention 
and was really a leading organization with partners in thinking about and making happen the, pre the prevention provisions in the Affordable uh, Care Act. Jeff, both at the Trust for America's Health and here at GW, is recognized as a, a national thinker and doer um, when it comes to integrating those practices and principles of uh, public health. Uh, to Jeff's left is uh, Rich Hamburg, who serves as the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Trust for America's Health. So these two gentlemen were close colleagues for many years, still are. Now they're just in slightly different. <laughs> I'm glad we could bring the two of you together this morning. It's nice to see you sitting next to each other. Uh, again, Rich played a significant role at TIFA and in coalitions with others to really think about those provisions in the Affordable Care Act and comes with a very long history of advocacy and government relations and was a, a leader in the American Heart Association um, and elsewhere. Um, in uh, spirit of full disclosure, I think of Rich as really quite an uh, accomplished policy strategist and he will be a guest lecturer in my class this evening. Um, talking about designing advocacy strategies. So nice to see you. Exactly. Nice to see you twice today, Rich. Um, Mike Frazier is the executive director of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials um, and working closely with, in a leadership capacity, the very people at the state level who are um, on the ground really working on the uh, public health issues, as all of us know. There are lots we can do at federal policy level and hopefully what we can do with resources, but so much of the action of what happens in terms of public health and prevention happens at the state and local level. And we're very lucky to have someone like Mike not only here with us this morning, but leading up ASTHO and uh, with his years of experience both in the field of medicine and public health and working very closely with the folks at the local and state level. And we're really looking forward to your remarks this morning, Mike. Thank you uh, for being here. Um, we're also lucky to have Mike serve as an adjunct faculty member here at, um, at GW. Last but not least, um, Jan Heinrich. Um, I have to say I am just thrilled to death that we now get to count Jan as a colleague at uh, the School of Public Health here at GW. Um, many of you may know Jan from her uh, years of uh, government service and leadership positions at the Government Accounting Office, the National Institutes of Health, Health Resources and Services Administration, and most recently at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. Interesting that that just came up on the last panel, and I'm hoping that Jan will take a few minutes uh, to share some info insights from that experience, but as well uh, from all of her other uh, roles at the federal government, and uh, Jan now joins us here at GW. Uh, so um, with those introductions, I guess I'd like to turn to Jeff, if you could start us off and maybe offer us a little bit of a framework of how to think about these issues inside uh, much of what we're doing around health care reform and where we find ourselves today. So I'm going to try to start with providing a little bit of an overview of how particularly the, the relationship between health care and public health can come together to improve health outcomes. And then my colleagues will dig a little bit deeper about specific elements of what is happening or we are trying to make happen uh, during the implementation of health reform and what may or may not be at stake in some of the current policy discussions. So I'm going to take sides with the in terms of where the previous panel was around value-based purchasing and agree. And I think Gail Walensky started us down that road uh, in the first panel in saying that payment reform, while it may not have been the central part of the debate, is a critical part of what is happening now in the healthcare delivery system. And the fact that it isn't part of the debate, I think, is driven by the fact that everyone understands that if we are going to contain costs, we are going to have to start thinking about how we pay for things. And the movement toward value-based purchasing is bipartisan. Uh, we saw it in the macro legislation. We saw it in what Secretary Burwell set as goals for uh, public payments. Um, so this notion, so the world is going to be changing regardless of what the insurance system looks like. The ability of us to do a good job in improving health, health outcomes is certainly going to be dependent on what the insurance system looks like, but the move toward value-based purchasing is there. I always like to start any conversations about where public health fits in and prevention fits in by saying, 
because most of us are not going to be talking about that. Insurance matters. The first two panels really matter. Insurance is a precondition for having this larger discussion around prevention and public health and improving health outcomes. So Gail Wilensky also mentioned that if we're moving toward value-based purchasing, we need to be thinking about social determinants of health or certainly thinking about population health. And population health has sort of become the new buzzword. Everyone's doing population health now because everyone says we should be doing population health. And it's sort of like public health used to be. Everyone has a slightly different definition of public health. Um, that said, uh, and so some people think of population health in a very geographic sense. So how am I improving the health outcomes of an entire community? A geographic community, a demographic community. Some will think of population health as improving the outcomes of an attributed patient panel. Um, the truth of the matter is, while we in public health like to think of much larger denominators, and ultimately that's where we need to go, and ultimately the health of a community is going to drive the health of individuals, whether someone's starting point is an entire community or an attributed panel, attributed population, or just a, you know, an individual phys clinician's uh, physician panel. If you are going to be competing in a, for over improving health outcomes, you are going to have to begin thinking about what happens outside the four walls of the clinic. Because the best advice around adherence to drug therapies, even if it's a medical intervention, is going to be driven by the community to which you return. The best advice about prevention and health behaviors is going to be driven by whether you have a walkable community, whether you have access to healthy foods or not. And we also know that some of the biggest predictors of health care costs are around social determinants. If you don't have stable housing, you are going to be much more expensive. And so the health system is going to be driven to begin thinking about those kinds of things. And so ultimately, we're going to have to move away from this notion of accountable care organizations, which is holding providers responsible for better management of clinical conditions. And even that better management of clinical conditions means thinking outside the four walls of the clinic, but in a relatively narrow sense. But we're going to have to move to be thinking about accountable health communities, where there's a shared responsibility, and this is where public health, community organizations, and the healthcare delivery system come together. A where there's a shared responsibility for the health of a community or a patient population across all of those sectors. Now that sounds like pie in the sky, but in reality what we're beginning to see is more and more initiatives across the country. Some of it driven by private philanthropy, some of it driven by state-level innovation supported by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. And if we see it soon, there's certainly an FOA out on the, that was, was put out on the streets by CMMI, $157 million in direct investment in creating those kinds of accountable health communities. We have a, this is essentially creating the building blocks for bringing health care delivery systems, public health, social services, and the community together to figure out what it takes to create a healthier community and to test whether in doing that we can improve health outcomes and lower cost and ultimately address some of those determinants of health. They're very exciting. You know, this is happening now. 13 states have accountable communities for health as part of their state innovation model grants. There are dozens of more experiments across the country that have, are taking a very similar type of approach. They all look very different. Some are very focused on addressing health-related social needs. Others are going upstream addressing social determinants of health. Some are building programs and services. Others are doing policies and systems change. So it's a very broad range of initiatives because we don't actually know yet what works. We're not quite throwing it up against the wall and seeing what sticks. We're looking at different approaches and then trying to assess them to see whether they will work. 
So this is a very different model. It's a different model for the healthcare system, and it's also a different model for public health about how it interacts with the world of health and helps and participates in creating health. So it's a different role then for public health departments. To, in a sense, they can become the chief health strategists for their communities. As people are thinking of building accountable communities for health or accountable health communities or whatever you want to call them, the public health department has the biggest vision of what is happening in the community, has the data and the knowledge of what works in making that link between social determinants and health outcomes, and can really become the leaders in making that kind of change. But as you will hear from my colleagues, there's a lot of work between here and there, both in support, providing the resources that it takes to start those initiatives, and having the capacity in health departments at the state and local level to do that, and the consistent and stable funding to support those efforts. Thank you, Jeff. Um, that's precisely the uh, focus that we've asked Rich if he wouldn't mind starting us off at least and sharing what was envisioned in terms of the kinds of supports, both programmatically and financial, to move us in that direction, and where do you see the state of play right now, and how we're going to navigate our way through? Thanks, Maureen. Appreciate it. And um, I guess the words um, quality, not quantity, uh, prevention and chronic health, or prevention of chronic health, improving public health from the Affordable Care Act is not like that 2,000 page document, but um, there was a lot in here. Um, unfortunately, a lot, I, I think a lot of what's in this part of the Affordable Care Act is in the part three that we hope they never get to. Um, you know, there's, there's what we saw last week, there, there's whatever the secretary can do over time, and then there's Lord knows what, what part three is. And, um, and I guess I'll, I'll, I'll hit some highlights here more on the um, on the funding side, a lot of other kids in the sandbox this morning have uh, have, have gone down um, the list of, of what many of the threats are, so maybe I'll just encapsulate. So, so this really was what was different, I think, in all the previous healthcare debates. You know, everyone who was around in the efforts in, in the 90s or the Nixon administration or, or I don't think anybody here is going back to, to Roosevelt, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, not that I, not that I know of, um, but uh, there was a lot in there, and it really was a focus on population health, on, on the public's health, uh, not just on the coverage. And, and um, a lot of this was under the radar screen, which I think was a good place to be over the last couple of years, although um, it's, it's uh, not been the best place to be on some of the provisions, including the Prevention and Public Health Fund that has gotten some um, unwelcome attention over the last uh, eight years uh, with, uh, as, as I think Dean referenced, uh, many if not most of those 60 efforts to, uh, to cut the Affordable Care Act. But, you know, just a reminder, National Prevention, uh, Health Promotion, Public Health Council with over 20 federal agencies working together across sector to try to figure out how to improve the nation's health and National Prevention Strategy, an advisory group chaired by my friend next to me here to that um, um, to that public health council, which, which I'm guessing may not be um, extended. Um, coverage of cl clinical preventive services that we talked about, an annual wellness visit under, under Medicare. I mean, there wasn't even an annual visit under Medicare. I remember 10 years ago when it was a big deal uh, with some cardiovascular coverage and a singular welcome to Medicare visit. I mean, that was only 2005 or so, so we've come a long way and um, community benefit provisions, um, the community health needs assessments that the hospitals are doing. There's just a lot, of, a lot going on. Um, on the funding side, there's, there's bad, worse, and, and, and the unknown. So the prevention fund is what's gotten a lot of attention the last, uh, the last few years. I mean, this, is a, this was meant to be a, an additional investment of up to $2 billion a year to supplement what had been you know, decades of chronic underfunding of public health programs. And while a robust investment, and it's over $7 billion since 2010, it's, it's come at the same time as some severe fiscal constraints, some changes in leadership in Congress soon after the passage of the Affordable Care Act, where it really you know, ended up being used for three categories, for new innovative programs, um, to bring 
um, programs that never had the resources to come completely to scale, you know, to be 50 state programs. It still amazes me that the Centers for Disease Control, there was never enough money to bring, and, and, until recently as they sort of consolidated funds, but for decades there wasn't money for, uh, to fight the nation's leading cause of death in all 50 states, maybe only 30 states, and diabetes in so many states, nutrition and physical activity in so many states. So the fund is still in danger. It's there. It, it, it's gone through um, five times or six times its nine lives already. Um, it does finance 12% of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's budget now, 12%. And if you take that, so just in and of itself, that's a uh, major danger to all these programs that we've talked about as a result of the uh, Cures Act that focused on the Food and Drug Administration, National Institutes of Health, some additional investments in uh, opioid treatment, all good things, but the idea that those funds would come from the prevention fund, uh, a lot of irony and you know, very unfortunate, and um, a, a fact that a lot of people uh, in the, in, in have, have sort of lost out on or, or forgotten about is this very fiscal year coming up, $100 million was lost out of the prevention fund. So if nothing else happens, Center for Disease Control and a couple of other federal agencies are going to have to make up for that hole. So that was, that was bad. Uh, the worst is the, um, you know, we've seen the, the skinny budget, uh, the FY18 budget from, uh, from the president. And, um, you know, that, that has a number of things to be worried about. One, a close to 18% across the board cut for health and human services. And not quite sure where those cuts will come, but if you just did some extrapolation, um, if nothing else happened, public health emergency preparedness would be cut from 660 million to 540 million, antibiotic resistance 160 to 130 million, racial and ethnic approaches to community health would lose 20% of its $50 million of, of funding. So, um, so uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a, an accountant, but the simple math of a 12% cut and an 18% cut is, is pretty massive, and, and um, so we have that on the table, and the devil will be in the, in the details. And I should mention that the kinds of things the Prevention Fund um, has funded, going back to that, $300 million for immunization programs, $160 million for better, preventive health and health services block grant, $120 million for tobacco prevention, diabetes money, heart disease money. I mean, oft referred to as, as a slush fund. Well, that's a good place to slush your funds, you know, if you're trying to improve the public's health. Um, uh, added to that, in addition, um, there's a look back for whatever reason, which you know, I think is dead on arrival, but nonetheless, we saw a little splash last week of some additional cuts to fiscal year 17. Um, also around um, 18, 17, 18 million dollars. And even if that's dead on arrival, it does kind of play the administration's hand on where things are going. Um, block grants, everyone loves a good block grant, as we heard earlier, and um, you know, the one thing we know about block grants, you know, particularly when, when we're talking about public health programs, is a block grant consolidates programs and then cuts money. So you never start out where you need to be. There was a wonderful proposal a couple of years ago that was floating around uh, Congress and the administration of actually significantly increasing the money and consolidating and trying to figure out how to find some economies of scale and efficiencies. This is not going to be the case, so we're very worried about a block grant. We'll likely block grant a lot of the chronic disease programs and, and, and the smaller ones, the, the epilepsy programs, and a lot of the, what I would call the, kind of the orphan um, programs would be the ones that, that would be most um, at risk. And then the last thing I want to mention, although a number of people has had previously, is uh, Trust for America's Health. We just put out a new, um, a new uh, piece on, um, on coverage of essential services and how important those are. And, um, and who knew that the, the debate, we were ready to put it out on Friday, the debate ended on Thursday night, but we put it out uh, anyway because we, you know, we do understand that this debate will continue and I can't tell you just how important, um, how complicated, but how important the essential services are and how critical they are to, uh, to maintaining the public's health. And then one last piece that I wanted to mention is that we also put out um, uh, a short brief called Prevention of Public Health 911 for America's Health, and that was a summary piece recognizing that a lot of the focus has been on the funding aspects of public health and the coverage issues and then the essential health benefits, um, that there are so many other pieces in here, and that includes the, um, um, the CMMI 
investments. It includes um, community benefit, uh, all kinds of, of provisions related to access to uh, clinical preventive services. And one that everyone's forgotten about, and I think assumed would be dead, and who knows, maybe it will be, is uh, menu labeling for, um, um, for restaurants. Um, that you know, some of us locally have seen in Montgomery County, some other places, and, and some of the states have, have gone in that direction. But uh, that's still on the table. So we're praying nobody notices that. We're praying that the accountable he health organizations uh, get their money that's supposed to be due out around now, and, uh, and we'll see what happens. But I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Wow, that was so nice of you to end on an uplifting note. I did find one thing. <laughs> there yeah, was such yeah, a long, yeah. oh, this is so yeah. sad and dark, but yeah. maybe if something happens. Oh. And I, I'm known as the glasses half full guy in, in the <laughs> circles. So. I see. I see. Uh, Mike, I think it would be um, really helpful for me and the rest of our audience and those listening uh, who are not here in the room to um, understand how you and your colleagues are um, experiencing this uncertainty and some of the challenges, but also in some ways how you're um, leading in ways that we might um, learn from in terms of ensuring, trying to protect some of what I think was advanced and then even getting further beyond that. Sure, sure. Thank you. It's great to, great to be with you this morning. Um, I'm Mike Fraser. I'm with the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, and I'm also pleased to be connected to GW through the adjunct uh, position. It's great to be with you. Um, ASS, though, is the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, and we have 59 uh, members across the country. I just got back from the Pacific Territories, which is why I'm a little uh, sleepy this morning. Um, but we do uh, work uh, with all of them on uh, public health and prevention efforts. And um, I see that you have Dr. Nesbitt joining you tomorrow afternoon. She's fantastic. She's a great example of what a state health leader, a territorial health leader looks like, and I definitely um, would urge you all to visit with her. Um, the ACA and public health was really you know, well summarized by both Jeff and Rich. Um, and for many health officials, um, the issues around healthcare delivery are not in their agency. Um, there's separate agencies at the state level that deal with Medicaid, but they're certainly closely aligned. And then we do have um, secretaries of health who oversee both the public health side and the um, healthcare delivery side, primarily through Medicaid uh, in their state. So we have a really, really mixed bag. And I think a couple things just to share to start, and then I'll give you a few examples. Um, I'd like to move the, the conversation upstream. I think that's really the job of public health. Um, having just returned from Saipan, which is a very small territory, uh, and touring their uh, combined public health and hospital uh, facility, their biggest challenge was expanding dialysis um, facilities on the island. Uh, and a lot of conversation around how do we finance that and not the same conversation around how do we prevent diabetes from getting to that point in the first place. And I think it's really our job moving forward to constantly move the conversation from this downstream focus <clears throat> on financing the delivery system and how to do that better. Uh, and, and trust me, there's not a lot of good ways to do that better. I mean, I think that the, the, the best way to do healthcare uh, delivery better is to keep people from utilizing these massively expensive uh, healthcare delivery systems that we have. And um, I think the, the other point I would make, the upstream versus downstream is, is one, but the other I would make is, you know, implicit in some of the remarks earlier is, is a perspective that, you know, demonizes the other in the sense that um, the, the narrative is something like um, Republicans are trying to take health care away from people. And that's true. I mean, I think that if you look at the facts, that's true. But really what the conversation is, is who should pay for that? I mean, that's, that's really at the core of the debate. It's, it's why are we spending so much and who should be paying for this? And I think it's a, it's a little bit of a different frame. So our members are positioned in their states to say, um, both we can help get better health through investments in prevention and we can save a, a lot of money through investments in prevention. And I think that's, that's the, the role of public health and, and governmental public health in particular. 
Um, when you look at uh, population health and you think about the, the link between governmental public health and the healthcare delivery system, you're going to find just a wide array of models in, in the 59 states and territories. And the framework that, that I've been using that's made a lot of sense in thinking about where our members should be playing in terms of this new, brave new world and, and in this uncertain environment is the um, Auerbach Three Buckets of Prevention article. I'm not sure if you all have had a chance to see that, but it really looks at um, the, the one bucket is the, the clinical services that are provided you know, by, a, by a physician or healthcare provider. The second bucket is this overlap of innovative community and clinical prevention. And then the third bucket is the sort of core public health, what's happening in the community. And what we're finding and what's been catalyzed through the ACA and, and proponents and opponents of it has really been what are those innovative models at the intersection of clinical care and, and community or population health writ large. And I think it's in that space where all these innovations are coming at CMMI and we're trying to make sense of um, how do we improve health both, you know, get more value but also improve health outside of the clinic and in the four walls, uh, as, as Jeff mentioned, of, a, of an exam room. And um, those, are, those are tough because we know, you know, people relate to care um, and, and we're coverage obsessed. I mean, you, 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 the first thing when you think of health is insurance. And that's, that's necessary but not sufficient to health. And all of these other investments that we're making uh, are really, really paltry sums. When you look at the problems we're facing, I think we spend three cents on the healthcare dollar in prevention. And going back to the beginning, you know, whose responsibility is health and whose responsibility is it to help us move upstream? And I would, you know, posit that a, a big role for government is to help create those conditions that assure health and, and would assure uh, better health and prevent us from, from having to consume so much at the, at the end, uh, the downstream consequences. Um, I would say uh, another place uh, where we're spending a lot of time with our members is really thinking through what is the governmental public health uh, role in helping healthcare delivery do its job better. And um, many health officials are very fluent in epidemiology and surveillance and regulation and core environmental health capacity but they're not as fluent, honestly, in the language of healthcare delivery or the, the hooks that they need to make to the large payers in their states or the large systems that are working in multiple states and have been able to sort of step back from that conversation. And what the ACA has done is really push everybody together to have this conversation about what does health look like in our state and how do we obtain that. And, um, it's, it's going to be interesting to see. I mean, I think that um, we've been telling health departments for a long time to um, get out of the, the ones that are doing clinical care, to get out of the clinical care business. There are publicly financed uh, clinics in many states, especially the southern states, that have a tradition of public health is really just publicly financed health care. Uh, and for years, we've been advising health officials to get out of that business, leave it to the market, you know, let the community health centers expand. Um, and, and what that's done is, is taken them out of this conversation around the delivery system and how do we help folks create value. And now we're trying to insert ourselves back in. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to see where, where states end up on some of these intersecting or that second bucket issues, things like um, STD and STI uh, control where you have this, uh, we're, we're seeing a huge increase, the, the, the biggest increases in STD rates in 20 years. I would posit that probably correlates pretty highly with the cuts in funding to STD programs over time. We've seen STD rates increase while we've expanded access to clinical care. We've seen childhood obesity rates increase while we've increased access to clinical care. It just proves the point that while necessary, the, the real drivers of health happen outside the clinic, in the community, and whose job is that? A big piece of that is governmental public health, and, and we're sort of the, the, the hidden heroes of that in, in many, many ways. And TIFA's done such a great job um, advocating for making visible what our members do in their states. 
Um, I, would, I would just wrap up by saying um, I think the future here is not us versus them. It, it's really going to be the we, the synergy of bringing together the healthcare delivery system and public health to really better understand what would um, true health look like. And it's not this crazy patchwork that we have, um, and it's going to be different in every state. And one of the things we do in Washington is like to have one solution. Um, and, and if you go out into any state, <coughs> you'll see how folks have had to adapt to that. What we've been telling our members is this is a key time for you to begin to innovate. You know, people are, people are really, uh, we're not, we're at gridlock here. I think it's going to get worse. I hate to say it. I'm, I'm half full too, Rich, but it, it's just, you know, I thought we were done with AHCA. It's coming back. I just can't deal with even reading the headlines anymore. But, you know, states are going to have to eventually say, enough of this. We got to figure this out for us. I got to balance my budget. And, and this, this Medicare piece, I mean, this Medicaid piece is really squeezing us. What are we going to do differently? What kind of waivers are we going to want? And how can we work better with public health? So I, I would close by saying, watch the states. I think it's where, that's where the action is going to happen on this one, because um, clearly there's, there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution that works. And again, make the case for that upstream perspective, because, you know, why are we spending so much on care? Um, why aren't we spending an equivalent amount on prevention in the first place? And I think that that's, those are the kinds of things that state health officials are talking about and I think are, are actually quite helpful in all of this um, uncertainty. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Jan, speaking of synergies and the we, um, as we have for years tried to think about reforming the system and passed the ACA and now looking at potential challenges to that, uh, some very smart people have been thinking for a while about what the implications of all that might be for the workforce and in fact what does that suggest we need to be thinking about when it comes to the workforce that we will be um, needing. I wonder if you could share some remarks this morning with us from your experience and very, very different and many perches in thinking about that issue. Yes, thanks so much. Um, so I will focus on the healthcare workforce and provisions under the ACA, uh, and also provide some comments on uh, working at uh, CMMI and throwing those models against the wall. So um, our, our, our primary focus when we started uh, with implementing the Affordable Care Act workforce provisions was to assure access to quality, affordable health care if, uh, if you don't have an adequate workforce, you will not have access to these essential services. Um, I hate to do this, but uh, we were asked uh, if we could use additional resources to expand the workforce for primary care. And if we had the resources, what would we do? And so uh, we said, of course, uh, we can provide expansion of uh, physician training, uh, nurse practitioner training, PA training uh, to expand the primary care workforce. So uh, our Secretary Sebelius announced a new $250 million investment to strengthen primary health care workforce initiatives under the ACA. And where did that money come from? Prevention. The Prevention and Public Health Fund, my dear colleagues. <laughs> <clears throat> but we used it uh, indeed uh, to expand the primary care workforce by 16,000. Um, and you all understand you need a fairly long pipeline uh, to uh, uh, achieve goals of that sort. Uh, we also worked with the states uh, on a provision in the ACA to encourage states to plan for an adequate workforce, um, which we also implemented. Um, people often think about the National Healthcare Workforce Commission that was named uh, to address workforce issues, but was never funded. Um, we did, however, 
have a National Center for Health Workforce Analysis headed uh, by Ed Salzberg, um, who we pulled in from the AAMC. Uh, and he was able to establish new reports on supply and demand uh, for the primary care workforce, um, nurses, adequate supply. Uh, and to this day, uh, we continue to have reports uh, such as the su supply and demand of selected behavioral health practitioners. Um, now, some people say, we're pretty good at analyzing the supply side, not so good at predicting what the future demand is going to be. And we wanted to understand that future demand in relation to new models of delivery uh, and payment that uh, were being funded uh, by CMMI. Um, the National Center didn't have a great deal of money. Currently, I think there's about four million. Um, but I wanted to call attention to the um, health workforce research centers that have been funded across the country. And uh, the George Washington University um, Health Workforce Research Center recently published a compilation of research uh, conducted uh, under these um, research centers. Part of our focus was to make better use of our existing workforce. And there's been a lot of discussion about team-based care, uh, interprofessional education, and practice. And we worked to encourage that interprofessional approach across all of our um, training programs. So in the nursing programs, the public health programs, uh, and the physician training programs. And we also established uh, one national center uh, for interprofessional practice and education in collaboration with private sector foundations, which is um, uh, still uh, going uh, today uh, with very innovative programs, focusing on the fact that we need a proof of concept here uh, with new delivery systems and payment models that indeed it really is more efficient, more effective, higher quality of care uh, when you're practicing in teams. We also focused on uh, state roles uh, where there's a great deal of statutory um, control and management of the health, health professions. And so um, looking at, and I'll just name a few of the states that are doing very innovative work, uh, Minnesota, uh, Idaho, Washington State, Oregon, Vermont, uh, where uh, they were looking at uh, new kinds of providers. So they're experimenting with the use of community health workers on teams, uh, community trained EMS workers uh, in remote areas uh, where they're linked with uh, primary uh, care providers and practices. Uh, and uh, new roles of, for behavioral health workers. And, it, it, and I, I shouldn't forget the dental therapist uh, where there were ongoing programs at the time uh, in Minnesota that we funded, and now there are many others, for example, in Vermont. Um, and we're able to show that with these additional workers uh, as part of teams, um, much better able to reach out um, to, to families uh, that are in greatest need. I, I can hardly ever uh, look at Dan Hawkins and not think of all the work under the negotiated rulemaking for medically underserved populations and health professional shortage areas. Uh, this was built into the ACA. Uh, this committee uh, worked for over a year uh, thinking through the implications of different methodological approaches for defining shortage-designated areas, 
which are essential for some of the Medicare payments as well as the community health centers and uh, 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 rural, uh, rural clinics. Um, they did not uh, ultimately come to 100% consensus and we were not able to go forward with the rulemaking, uh, but they did enormous uh, good work in developing new methodologies um, that are still there, just have not been uh, implemented. One other program that I would like to uh, highlight is uh, the teaching health centers. The um, ACA provided uh, $230 million from 2011 uh, to 2015 uh, to stand up uh, the teaching health center program. Um, we did not have uh, a budget allocation for uh, developing planning grants uh, for uh, the teaching health centers, but were able to work with ACGME, um, the states, um, community health centers to find ways of providing the technical assistance for health centers to work with others in their community, um, oftentimes building a consortium uh, of providers linking with hospitals, public health, and the health centers and developing these very innovative graduate medical education training programs. And I think when the Macy Foundation recently uh, did a nationwide survey of innovations in graduate medical education, they certainly did find that the teaching health centers were um, a, a model for innovation. Um, now, the <coughs> it wasn't an easy program to stand up. Uh, the language was modeled after the Medicare program and after the Children's Hospital Graduate Medical Education program. Legal counsel wasn't especially helpful to us. Uh, it was as though they wanted us to bring in a hospital bed and chain a resident with a sign on, a, on their back that said, this is a teaching hospital center resident tied to a bed. Uh, and it was pretty difficult for us to make the argument that, you know, we weren't at the bedside, we were at the curbside, and we were in communities of very high need. Uh, and in spite of um, recent funding uh, decreases, uh, these programs are still highly successful of finding a variety of uh, lines of uh, financing uh, to continue. Uh, <clears throat> Let me just um, make a few comments on the work that I was able to uh, do at uh, CMMI. Um, I worked primarily with um, the population health group but also the state innovation model groups there. Um, originally, uh, I was asked to go to CMMI because they wanted a secret plant that could actually see what was going on in relation to the innovations and uh, the implications for the health workforce. As it turned out, these changes take a very long time to implement and we did uh, immediately see a lot of changes in the workforce uh, other than to see that um, a variety of health professions were doing care coordination and the community health um, workers um, were being in employed in increasing numbers in these uh, new models of care, the ACOs and certainly in the um, uh, community health centers. Um, <clears throat> within the uh, state um, innovation models, there was a focus on our part to do everything we could to integrate population health, clinical services, and the social determinants in the social services. And it's not surprising that we see within the state innovation models a number of examples of experiments with the uh, uh, accountable health communities or uh, accountable communities for health. Um, and in the second round, we actually required uh, states to implement a population health improvement plan that actually 
provided the integration with um, population health, clinical services, and multi-sector engagement uh, in the health improvements and the priorities that the states, in fact, uh, put in place. Uh, so with the president's budget, um, we do see a zeroing out of um, the health workforce training programs, uh, not the National Health Service Corps, um, but the training programs. Um, in the past, that has happened, and um, Congress has not gone along with this, but um, we don't know what the future will hold. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Um, I think we have like a minute or two for questions, so if folks have some questions, um, I'll ask you to come to the mic. If not, we're getting close to the time of wrapping up, and we'll be here for another few minutes, so we'd also be happy to entertain your questions. I do want to say in some ways as a, a, a summary, but I will allow the Dean to do that for sure, um, that I was thinking as we were going through this panel, as we think about programs, projects, structures, organizations, institutions, how important they are and what many of us in the policy world are thinking about all the time. But I'm glad in some ways we're ending, I think the way we also began, is to keep in, um, in, in the forefront of our minds is it's about people. First and foremost, the people who, will, who, are, be, who are given uh, coverage now and the opportunity to um, have the supports to uh, be taken care of when they're sick and also have the supports to think about being uh, well. And then to also think, conclude with this panel, think about who are the people um, that will be needed both in terms of caring for folks in the clinical um, environment, but also those who will be in the community um, and working to think about prevention and wellness and the role of that public health officer as a chief health strategist to think about the other workforce folks. And the dean has her hand raised. Been uh, patient here all day, wanting to hear about this. So I'm going to inflict this upon this panel. But one thing that uh, I've, I've been recognizing is that as long as this has now been in place, the Affordable Care Act, which has now been what six, seven years, yeah. that we still aren't at a place where we can clearly analyze what the impact has been on the public's health. At least I haven't heard that from any of you, and I haven't seen that in the media. And so. You know, at what point are we able to discern that and are we going to have the ability to disentangle all the many impacts um, in terms of understanding which aspects of the act have actually been impacting health? Because there's so many things that are new in, in terms of, you know, supporting the essential services, many of which are preventive services. And uh, the prevention fund itself, which I'm not sure is actually increase the funding for prevention in this country, so maybe you can't really point to any significant increases in prevention, but certainly in terms of providing care uh, for people, um, and you know, I've had members of my own family who did not seek, did not receive care, in one case died because of being uninsured. So I, I recognize there's an impact, as even though I'm Dean of Public Health, I know that medical care sometimes does save your life. Um, but, um, <laughs> I, I would just like to hear, you know, a brief, you know, briefly from each one of you, you know, what, what your response to that is, or, or do you think that we do know that um, now, and we just haven't been bringing that through? So I, I think the short answer is we certainly don't know in a comprehensive way, and even though the legislation passed seven years ago, it took a good three, four years to, you know, we, for, for a lot of people, they're just beginning to get, for example, the coverage that they need. And I think we have a lot of noise in some of the initial data where you see a, a spike in demand for services and people may, and some of that has to do with dealing with pent up need. And so it's going to take time to see that level out in terms of the access to insurance coverage and the access to care ultimately resulting in that portion of what biomedical care can, and behavioral health can provide in terms of evening out costs. On the prevention side, there have been new investments. The problem is that we, as a 
political society can't seem to sustain those investments. And we hop from communities putting prevention to work to community transformation grants to partners, partnerships to improve community health. And now those are going away. So we aren't sustaining those investments. Are some of those policy and systems changes that were initiated under those different programs probably having an impact on health? Yes. Are we systematically evaluating that? No. And so I think that's going to make it hard to do. So before I give up the microphone, though, I need to, Dan Hawkins acknowledged her earlier in a different role, but Ellen Murray is in the room. We wouldn't be talking about Title IV. We wouldn't be talking about all these prevention initiatives if it were not, not just for Ellen, but her boss, Senator Tom Harkin, who was the driving force behind creating Title IV and recognizing that prevention needed to be a fundamental, just like it needed to be added to the name of the Centers for Disease Control, it needed to be a fundamental part of the Affordable Care Act. And that culture shift is really important. And whether we see that in immediate health outcomes or not, I think because those elements were in the Affordable Care Act, we're having this population health discussion now. Mm -hmm. so ne next time we'll have the Affordable Prevention Act and there will be a clinical care fund. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's a very provocative question. I think it's a good one. I think that um, uh, the AC, if you're if you're looking for the impact of ACA, y y you got to go much more granular. I mean, it was thousands of pages and tons of initiatives. Um, but you're pointing to uh, a messaging problem that we have in public health right now, which is. Um, we are seeing uh, some great numbers when it comes to infant mortality, um, teen pregnancy, and um, the number of people uninsured all have gone down since the implementation of, of ACA, whereas conversely, um, CDC just uh, published data in December suggesting that life expectancy is actually plateaued and maybe declining, and if you look at the um, life expectancy by different race and ethnic group. It continues to be a huge gap. Um, and our healthcare costs, while slowing, are still increasing. So I think it points to a point I made earlier, which is it's not reasonable to expect health improvements uh, to, to come this quickly, true, but also from um, primarily increasing individual access to, to health insurance. Um, there's still a lot more that contributes to health. And so while necessary, it's not sufficient. And to expect your primary care provider in the seven minutes that she has with you to address, you know, a lifetime of exposure or stress or poor decisions or all of those other things it's just not reasonable. And, and clearly, um, there's a lot of other things we need to look at. So uh, I would say, uh, by and large, the success has been, if you're looking at increasing um, access and uh, coverage, sure. And that's why we're so concerned about rolling that back. If you're looking at what's the quantifiable health improvement that's resulted, it, you know, it's, it's a spurious relationship. Think of the people that just got care. They're really sick folk. That's why these exchange plans are going bust, because they're really expensive to care for. Of course, it's going to cost a lot of money. These are folks who haven't had insurance before. So, you know, I think some of that's got to work itself out. Whether it'll have the chance or not, I think, is what's got us all nervous. But we have to get to a much broader conversation around what health is and what wellness really looks like. And the, the sick care system we have should not be um, expected to create 100% of health. It's just not possible. And I think that's why, uh, as students of public health, we all have to really look upstream and say, what's causing uh, these, these downstream rates, and where can we intervene? And it's, it's too late when you've fallen off the cliff. Okay. It's okay. absolutely now, too late. Now quickly, I think Janet may have a different point of view. Um, did you want to chime well, in? I want to give you the time you need for your... Um, all, all I was going to say is from CMMI's required evaluations, they're all going in the right direction of yeah. improvement as okay. well as cost control. Yeah, I totally agree with, with Jeff. The, these programs have bounced around. They've come and gone. It's, it's tough to evaluate. We have pockets where we had some evaluation, tobacco cessation 
investments um, uh, made available through Fredericton Public Health Fund have had some really significant um, uh, numbers come in. Um, the diabetes prevention program now looking um, to actually convince the actually convince the actuary at HHS and coverage yep. uh, in April of, of 2018, and uh, you know, and definitely there's some studies that show expanding coverage for preventive services. You know, we see an uptick in, in exams, and but it's not it's not comprehensive. It, it absolutely the investment either the investment isn't there or the programs aren't around long enough to be able to to make those investments. And there's a reason why uh, investments in prevention uh, are hard to score and are, are long term. Um, but we have to put more resources into the evaluation side moving forward or, or we'll never get where we need to go. Okay, so now it is my time to close. I'm not going to try to summarize this day, but I, I do want to remind everybody that this is National Public Health Week, as it says up here, and you can see on the boards that there's some other things happening later this week. Tomorrow is our research day, and we're going to have a keynote address at 4.30 right here by Dr. Laquandra Nesbitt, who is the um, health officer for the District of Columbia, brilliant uh, person, great speaker. It's going to be um, she's always provocative. On Thursday morning at 10, the American Public Health Association is co-sponsoring a symposium here on the health impacts of climate change. It'll be at 10 o'clock, and again here in the auditorium. Thursday evening, we're screening a film called Dying in Vain, and um, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse will be with us to comment on the opiate epidemic and, and the policy response to that. And last but not least, on Friday, we have Cecile Richards here from Planned Parenthood in USA. Um, uh, however you feel about those issues, um, that is a very important um, voice to hear um, at, at this juncture. Uh, the, the issues around women's health are pivotal, I think, um, across many of the discussions um, in Congress. So with that, um, I once again want to thank our panel, our, my faculty. I did not mention earlier Maureen Burns, who oh. led this panel. Thank you, Maureen, Dr. Janet um, Heinrich, Jeff Levy. Thanks to you all. Have a great day, and I think that we want to do a photo of the panel, right? So don't leave. Don't move. Yeah. Actually, every time I mention you, she remembers the conference. Right. <laughs> 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 Were you out there? I was out there. Just after this moment. Specific little memory that snaps here. I think that's <laughs> true. <laughs> 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 I was checking the score. Thank you. I saw your picture. I'll be there tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah. I know. I know. How are you? I recognize you. How are you? Oh, don't go. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Sounds good. Hey, Ben. Funny. I, uh, yeah, nice check last night for Matt. Um, yeah, when, when's the first game that uh, you guys go to? I think I go tomorrow. That's good. Good, 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 good. Yeah, I got to hang out with Matt a couple weeks ago at a reception, so we caught up on everything about the family and everything else. Thanks. Good to see you, Luis. Starts in the night, goes to CDC, goes to CMS. You know, theory to practice to reimbursement. That's the way we should be doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
straight. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. How are you doing, Richard? That's fine. 2175. I like hearing a synopsis of my language. Yeah, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just need to hear it all put together. No, no, no. Well, I have my ID. You all put it together? That actually is very correct. Good to see you. How are you doing? Hi. Nice to meet you, Mike Fraser. Sure. I had lunch with Norris yesterday. Oh, yeah? Good. I, uh, I, I, I heeded um, He's a good guy. He's a how the you know, presentation of the panel that I was Within using. whatever constraints, I'll speak oh, sure. Most of the time, that's it's complex. Good. So frustrating. Oh, so glad I think it's very, very, very folks have a great idea. I don't know if I'm trying to remember. Exactly, yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Not that I wouldn't have There's a lot of third rail touching the still I know, but it's been so long since we really tried to do Right, right. It's policy interventions are where the action is, right? So, I mean, that's really impressive. Looking at uh, my husband's uh, reading book, help in all policies. Be part of the uh, Hope Brothers really sort of developed you know, some of these innovations okay. around image of a lot of So it's kind of a thing. I think are changing. Now everyone realizes people are beginning to understand how it is. You know, we're going to have to do this drop by drop by drop. Yeah, yeah. So it's. It's um, it, it can be it can be frustrating. But keep it up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Years to make sure you can reach those numbers. Great to see you. How are you? Nice to see you. How are you doing? Well, thank you. you we've committed to protecting your your fine work. <laughs> Yeah, it's just me. Yeah, this is one of those things. Yeah, yeah. But it happens. Yeah. I agree, Price doesn't like these models. So I'm afraid you won't look at them. How you reverse that one? Yeah, yeah. Hopefully that sneaks through. I mean, I think that probably, I hope, is catching something. Yeah. Good deal, too. I'll talk to you later, Rich. that I thought you all might be able to answer. Um,
You want me to log this one out? These two labs right here. Yeah, we pulled one from Kane Study and one from the basement. Okay, are they both? Yeah. But we're going to keep them in here for this week. Okay, so Brad already put the other one on the frequency it needs to be on? He should have. Okay.
Ah, uh, and here I'm not sure they're going to have another 